So hello everyone, welcome to another session of free, you know, live discussion on the test which we held today. All of you, I hope all of you, all of you, uh, all of you were able to answer all the questions which were being asked in today's test. And in this session, in this session, we will be talking about, we will be discussing the answers. We will be discussing the answers to the questions which were based on Indian art and culture. You can always comment in the comment section. You can also interact. Use this also as an interactive session. Interact with but I will get back to you for sure. Okay? So let's get started with the questions. Okay? Let's get started with the question. So the, the first question. Okay? What was the first question? Discuss the journey. Okay, discuss the journey of Indian cave paintings. Okay, discuss the journey of Indian cave paintings. Basically, paintings. Okay, paintings. If you, if you, if you, if we talk about paintings, paintings in general can be divided into two forms. Broadly speaking, 
it can be divided into two forms okay mural painting and miniature painting what's the difference uh, i think i told about this difference the other day also in one of my previous classes also the difference is mural painting is done mainly on solid surfaces okay surfaces like walls okay it could be a temple wall it could be the wall of a cave okay all the paintings which are done on solid surfaces like walls are known as mural paintings and miniature painting is something which is done on perishable items like cloth and paper let's say and a beautiful example of a miniature painting would be the illustrations which you may find in between certain books okay that's an example of what that's an example of a miniature form of painting but now we are talking about cave paintings so cave paintings were they were primarily mural paintings okay they were primarily they were not miniature paintings they were primarily mural paintings and this answer basically in this answer we will have to talk about the journey of indian cave paintings okay as we all know the journey started way back okay the journey mane dhora a modern india start hua na okay ancient india to start hua na in fact it's very very surprising the journey started in the pre historical period now before okay before moving any further you have to understand the meaning of prehistory okay you have to understand the meaning of prehistory can somebody tell me the meaning of prehistory if you know the answer please leave your comment in the comment section below what is the meaning of prehistory prehistory mane ki prehistory mane ki mo kone kobo paribo okay there are 16 people who are viewing this video right now anyone can answer what is the meaning of prehistory prehistory mane ki kon bhai jane re prehistory no so prehistory basically means what okay prehistory hitesh is saying no written document available yeah you are very close to the answer but not exactly the answer okay that's not exactly the answer so no written document available no hoy prehistory is a phase where the people did not have a uh, did not have a script that or had not script nasile okay prehistory is that phase of history wherein people did not know how to write to simply put okay manu bi lage kene ke likhibo lage likhar jonto vidya likhar likhar jonto art they did not know the art of writing thik ase that phase is known as prehistory thik ase aru historical phase refers to that period when people had started okay when people had started uh, knowing the art of writing okay people had started the Uh, people had started knowing the art of writing there is another term okay there is another term by the name of proto history what is the meaning of proto history so proto history is that phase of history jot niki tumar when people knew how to write okay when people had a script proto history refers to that period of history when people knew how to write they had a script but we have not been able to understand what exactly they wrote for example a beautiful example of a proto history civilization would be indus valley civilization because they knew how to write okay they knew how to write but we have not been able to understand or decipher their language or decode their language okay so without any further delay so let's trace the journey of prehistoric or indian cave paintings see the journey like i said of indian cave paintings can be broadly divided Uh, so the journey it can be in itself can be divided into prehistoric and historic journey okay prehistoric and historic journey the history of indian paintings as per the latest historical evidence like i say started in the prehistorical period itself and was done on the cave walls okay and the earliest example of prehistoric paintings is what bhimbedka rock paintings okay there is this Okay, there is this beautiful place. Okay, there is this magnificent or fascinating place by the name of Bhimbedka Rock. Okay, Bhimbedka Rock Shelters. Bhimbedka Rock Shelters actually it comprises a group of caves. Okay, it is not just one single cave; it's a group of caves. And if you enter that complex, you will see many paintings have been done on the walls of those caves. And that is the earliest. Because that is the earliest. As of now, okay, as of now, I mean, or a. As we talk, a mohur to the arvada discovery hobo pare. Thikha sir, we are not taking those discoveries into consideration. Moi koi so as of now, okay, as of now, Bhimbet ka rock paintings are the they are the earliest example of they are the earliest example of prehistoric rock paintings in India. 
Okay, they are the earliest examples. So idea, these paintings were, like I say, they were mural paintings. Now let's talk about the body. Now first let's talk about the prehistorical period. The earliest example, like I said, are Bhimbeska cave paintings. Where are they located? They are located in the Madhya Pradesh. Okay, they are located in the Madhya Pradesh state of India and they are also located in the Vindhyan Hills. Okay, Vindhyan Hills. See the paintings here. Now we have to talk. Okay, we have to talk about the Bhimbeska rock paintings in a bit more detail. Okay, in a bit more detail we have to talk. The paintings of the Bhimbeska rock paintings, they belong from... They belong from the Upper Paleolithic period. Okay. They belong from the Upper Paleolithic period to Iron Age. See, what is the meaning of Upper Paleolithic period? So, prehistoric, prehistoric period has been divided into several phases. And the earliest phase as per historians is the Paleolithic Age. Okay. Paleolithic Age itself has got three divisions. Now is not the time to understand. But the division which came last is known as what? Upper Paleolithic. And Upper Paleolithic age ended with the uh, Ice Age. Okay, it ended with the Ice Age around 10,000 BC. And what was the time duration of the Upper Paleolithic age? It started from somewhere around 40,000 BC and it ended till 10,000 BC. Why did it end? Because Ice Age uh, ended. Okay, not started, but Ice Age ended and people started exploring new places after 10,000 BC. Anyway, so this is the time duration I'm talking about. When I say Upper Paleolithic Age, I'm talking about the time spent starting from 40,000 BC and ending at 10,000 BC. Now, some of these paintings belong to the Upper Paleolithic period. Some of these paintings, but and they went as far as Iron Age. Iron Age refers to that age when iron was discovered. Okay when iron was in use now see but most of the paintings belong to which time period most of the paintings belong to the mesolithic period what is the meaning of mesolithic period mesolithic period is like a transitional phase okay it is like a transitional phase between paleolithic period and neolithic period what is the meaning of transitional phase transitional phase is that phase when the society is undergoing many changes Okay, transition. Okay, the word transition itself means what? Change. Hal holoni bohutu hal holoni ghotisil. Homas kono. Now swa, mukikolo. Most of the paintings, however, belong to the Mesolithic period. Very, very important point. Most of the paintings belong to the Mesolithic period. Very, very important point. Okay. A comparison between the Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic paintings would give us an idea okay regarding certain important changes in the social life of humans what is the difference between the paintings which belong to upper paleolithic and which belong to which belong to mesolithic phase there are a lot of differences and what is the importance of those differences those differences as you notice those differences in a careful manner you will also see that along with the differences you can also make out that society itself is changing Okay, that society itself is changing. For example, in the paintings which belong to the Mesolithic period. Okay, in painting, we, um, you know, we, 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 we have something called themes. Mane themes mane ki, ki subject to report tahati aki ase. Okay, that is what themes are. So, the themes, okay, the themes of the Mesolithic era painting of Himbetka rock painting, Junkini, the paintings which belong to Mesolithic phase are very interesting. What were the themes? Okay, they selected certain themes like childbirth. Okay, they selected certain themes like childbirth, child uh, rearing, then hunting scenes were depicted. But only males were shown hunting, whereas the women and the other girls were shown doing what? They were, they were shown doing gathering activities. So from that we can say that while the women folk, okay, while the women folk used to do all the gathering tasks, the male folk were mainly they, they they used to focus mainly on hunting so they were basically hunters and gatherers again another very important theme was that there is a painting okay there is a painting which belongs to mesolithic phase which shows a group of people living together so what does all these indicate all these indicate that some sort of a family life some sort of a Family life, okay, family, some sort of a family life may have started 
during Mesolithic period. Another very important theme, another very important painting which you will get to see, okay, in the Bimbetka rock paintings belonging to Mesolithic phase is the picture of flames, flames, dhuan. Because they have, and what is the importance of this picture? Because we get to see the picture of flames. Because we get to see the picture of flames, we can conclude J fire must have been discovered. So this is the importance. So Abilak or Karane, UPSC hog by APC hog. This is why they ask these questions. Because they give us, they give us deep insights. They give us deep insights into that period. Okay. See, again, the size of the Bhimbetka cave paintings. Okay. If you talk about the size, the size of the Bhimbetka cave paintings, Hidesh, uh, yeah. Uh, the size of the Bhimbetka cave painting, size also varied. Mane, Hokolubila uh, paintings or size was not uniform. AK size or Nasil. Okay. The size also varied. Some of the paintings were as tiny as 1 centimeter. And some of them, they went up to 5 meter also. So the size also varied. The size also varied. And let me also tell you one more thing. These are the paintings we are talking about. The paintings, uh, let's say the paintings which belong to the Upper Paleolithic era. Or let's say the paintings which belong to, which belong to the Mesolithic phase. Ebilaki man, expert painters nasile. Okay, please get that thing. Uh, please get this thing registered in your minds. They were not expert painters. They were not expert painters. Mane Tati consciously they did not paint. Mane they started recording their day-to-day -day events in the form of paintings. They never thought that somebody sitting in the 21st century would talk about those paintings. Had they known that, they would have paid more attention. Aru, moreover, options so Imantari expert painters nasi. These are not examples of the uh, these are not certain examples of the best of Indian paintings. Mane in terms of ki mane dora in terms of aesthetic, okay, in terms of aesthetic beauty, these are not the best of Indian paintings, obviously. But even then they have a lot of historical importance. So uh, now let's talk about the journey of uh, cave paintings in the historical period. Now, there is a very famous cave by the name of Jogi Mara Cave and the paintings of that cave are also famous. And where, it is, uh, where the Jogi Mara Cave is located? It is located in the Chhattisgarh state of India. Okay? And the Jogi Mara Caves are, or the paintings are pre-Buddhist in origin. They are pre-Buddhist in origin and swa, this line is important. This is considered to be humans first attempt as expert painters. Okay, like I said, like I said, uh, the, 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 the painters, okay, the painters of the Bhimbetka rock, okay, the painters of the Bhimbetka rock shelters were not expert painters, but the ones who painted, okay, the ones who painted on the walls of Jogimara caves were expert painters. In fact, it is considered to be humans first attempt as expert painters, okay. Then, obviously, we have to talk about Ajanta Caves, okay, talking about cave paintings would be incomplete if we do not talk about Ajanta Caves because Ajanta paintings or the paintings which you find inside of Ajanta Caves are considered to be the fountain head, okay, they are considered to be the fountain head of all classical paintings of Asia, that is the importance, Mane, all the other classical paintings of Asia that have emerged in different parts of Asia, they have taken inspiration from where? They have taken inspiration from Ajanta paintings. Okay, now let's talk about Ajanta paintings. So Ajanta paintings basically are known for two things. Number one, naturalism and number two, freehand style of drawing. When a freehand style of drawing, when they used to draw pictures, they used to paint without the help of any devices. Okay, freehand. Okay, freehand. Okay, without the help of any devices. That is known as what? That is known as freehand style of drawing. Very, very important. Now, so other than that, why did we say that it is known for naturalism? Because the painters of the Ajanta, okay, the painters of uh, the painters of the Ajanta caves, they used to get the basic colors from the natural surroundings. You also have to know about the location of Ajanta caves. We all know Ajanta caves were located on the Western Ghats. Okay, they are in Aurangabad district. They are in Aurangabad district of Maharashtra and very very close. They are very very close to the Western Ghats. So naturally it was, 
very natural for the painters of the uh, of the of the of the of the ajanta caves to collect okay or to get the basic colors from whatever was available in the western ghats for example from lamp suit okay lamp suit they used to get the black color okay for example they used to get the blue color from lapis lazuli and for example they used to get the white color from lime mane soon thik ache so and after acquiring the basic colors so if you are those of you who are into painting would know that by mixing basic colors we can get many more colors so a basic colors kini tahati nature of paisil then they used to mix these basic colors to get many more colors baba how advanced they were okay now uh then we also can talk about see uh, now uh talking about the ajanta cave painting some of the most famous cave okay some of the most famous cave paintings of ajanta would include the painting of padma pani okay the the painting of padma pani who was padma pani padma pani was also a bodhi he was a bodhi sattva very very important okay padma pani you might have seen the image of padma pani holding a lotus okay you might have seen the image of padma pani holding a lotus very very important padma pani he is considered to be a bodhi sattva and bodhi sattva by the way i hope you guys know that it's a very important part of mahayana form of buddhism okay padma pani is a part of what mahayana form of buddhism and in fact and in fact the dalai lama okay dalai lama dalai lama is considered to be an incarnation of padma pani okay he is also known as avalokiteshwar padma pani is also known as what avalokiteshwar and he symbolizes what he symbolizes compassion he represents what he represents compassion theek hai sir doya mamata okay he he he, he these are his attributes theek hai sir because every bodhisattva has his or her own attributes and these are the attributes of padma pani or avalokiteshwar then similarly we also have a painting of vajra pani who is vajra pani another bodhisattva okay vajra pani is another bodhisattva and this is a very interesting painting we also have the painting of ulakashin the second okay if you go to the ajanta caves you will also see a painting of ulakashin the second receiving an embassy okay apparently uh, you know apparently an embassy was sent okay apparently an embassy was sent by the shah of iran by the name of khusru he was the shah of iran or the king of iran he had sent an embassy and this picture shows pulakashin the second who was pulakashin the second he was okay he was one of the greatest rulers of the chalukyan dynasty okay pulakashin the second he is also said to have defeated harsha vardhana okay he is also said to have defeated harsha vardhana of thaneshwar or harsha of kanauj okay very very powerful ruler and in this picture he has been shown receiving an embassy he has been shown receiving an embassy sent by shah of iran khusru okay see and the earliest jain cave paintings okay the earliest jain cave paintings can be seen and sitta navasal cave paintings of tamil nadu okay sitta navasal cave paintings of tamil nadu are the earliest jain cave paintings okay they are the earliest ki they are the earliest jain cave paintings okay now what can we say in conclusion in conclusion we can say that from the prehistorical period itself humans started giving their thoughts and expression in the form of paintings okay and with time with time this expression of creativity with time this expression of creativity developed into a proper art okay with time this expression of creativity developed into a proper uh developed into a proper art and today as we all know painting is one of the most important art forms of india okay today as we all know painting is one of the most important art forms of india hitesh sir please sorry painting and himbir ka can you refer as entertainment purposes of that time people no 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 see hitesh uh people they were more focused on survival tahati jiyai thoka tue eta bahut dangor kotha asel because they were not into agriculture they were into hunting and gathering so tahati ki khabo they were not into agriculture they they the biggest problem was survival so tahati entertainment ro karane no etia leke dhora unfortunately nothing much can be said about the purpose mane dhora hitesh is asking a very interesting question he would say je manu bilake entertainment ro karane bimbet ka cave paintings or paint korisel niki 
okay i don't think so i don't think so it seems improbable because their immediate concern was survival so that the entertainment was something which was alien to them they did not even know what entertainment was so i don't think so i don't think so but having said that having said that we are talking about such a phase of history that we do not know much about so we have to accept that thing so amar lack of historical evidence karon historical period e noy so lack of archaeological evidence or karone ba lack of evidences or karone we cannot say for sure the entertainment or karone korisil na bele karone korisil okay hope you got the answer hitesh now let's move on to the next question what is classical sanskrit Give an elaborate account of the classical Sanskrit literature that developed during ancient India. Very very important question. Okay, one fifty words, ten marks. Now, what is the meaning of classical Sanskrit? Okay, what is the meaning of classical Sanskrit? So, a classical Sanskrit is that form of Sanskrit. So, uh, the Sanskrit, the Sanskrit which you will find in the Vedas is not classical Sanskrit. Okay. the sanskrit which you will get to see in the vedas i am talking about vedas not the other uh, works okay that is not what that is not classical sanskrit that is that is let's say if we have to give a name although there is no proper name that is the ancient sanskrit okay that is the ancient sanskrit and you will find ancient sanskrit in the vedas i am talking about that sanskrit which according to many many scholars has a relation has a relation with the language of zen avesta Okay, has a relation, has a deep relation with the language of Zen Avesta. What is Zen Avesta? The holy book of the Parsis. Okay, Zoroastrianism. Okay, Zen Avesta. And this language also has a relation, according to the scholars, with the other European languages, with most of the other European languages, like for example, Greek and Latin also. Okay, now so now what is the meaning of classical Sanskrit? Classical Sanskrit it came a bit later. Okay, it came a bit later, and classical Sanskrit. uh can be dhora the origin can be credited to a great scholar by the name of panini who roughly belonged to around let's say 500 bc akhe pakhe okay 500 bc er akhe pakhe he belonged to that particular period the panini he wrote a book on sanskrit grammar by the name of ashta adhyayi okay he wrote a book okay he wrote a book on sanskrit grammar by the name of ki Ashta Adhyayi, in which he talked about certain grammatical rules and regulations to be followed. Okay, sir. All the works, all the Sanskrit works that are based on this Ashta Adhyayi, or all the Sanskrit works that follow the rules and regulations laid down by Panini in Ashta Adhyayi, all those mane thora the language which follows the rules and regulations of Panini is known as what? classical sanskrit okay i hope i'm clear with this and uh, if i have to give you an example of where you will find classical sanskrit in i will say you will find classical sanskrit i mean the epics okay the epics the epics mahabharata and ramayana okay they are known as itihasa or epics okay so they were written in this language okay classical sanskrit a lot of other vedic scriptures were also written a lot of other i mean so when we say vedic literature it is not just about the vedas a lot of other things will also come in vedic literature so a lot of the other things were also written down in classical sanskrit uh, language now let's come to the second part of the question give an elaborate account of the classical sanskrit literature that developed during ancient india okay During ancient India, now so actually a huge corpus, okay, a huge amount of classical Sanskrit literature it developed during ancient India, a huge amount, a huge amount. And to make a very good start, we have to start with what? We have to start with Ashwagandha's Buddha Charita, a poem which was written in classical Sanskrit language. A poem. It was a poem. Now you may be wondering, you may be wondering. It was a poem based on Buddha. The name itself is Buddha Charita. And who was Ashwa Ghosha? Ashwa Ghosha was the vice president during the Fourth Buddhist Council, which was held under the patronage of whom? Kanishka the Great. Now, clearly, Ashwa Ghosha himself was a Buddhist. But and as we all know, the language which gets associated with Buddhism normally is Pali. So why is why is this chap? Okay, why is Ashwa Ghosha using Sanskrit? Actually, as per the scholars, Ashwagandha was a Brahmin. 
Okay, he was initially a Brahmin. He then, you know, he then embraced Buddhism. And once he embraced Buddhism, embracing another religion is fine. So after embracing Buddhism, he did not change his language. Okay, he kept on writing in the same language which he knew earlier. So he kept on writing in Sanskrit. Okay, and by the way, this is also a very important development. It is one of those things. Okay, if you if you if you talk about the factors which led to the decline of Buddhism, many scholars agree that this was one of the factors which led to the ultimate decline of Buddhism. What was one of the factors? Use of Sanskrit, because uh, when they started using Sanskrit in place of Pali, because traditionally the Pali language. Okay, was the language which got associated with Buddhism, but now that they have started using Sanskrit, as per scholars, slowly and steadily, they started losing their identity. Okay, Buddhism started losing its identity, and it was, it was, you know, it was a big stride. It was a big stride towards this decline. Because according to scholars, now apart from this, okay, apart from this, if we talk about uh, the development of Sanskrit literature. Okay, if we talk about the development of classical Sanskrit literature that took place during the Gupta period, we have to start with. See, we have to start with a ruler by the name of Chandragupta Vikram Aditya II, who is who is widely considered to be the greatest of the Gupta kings. Now, this this great king by the name of Chandragupta Vikram Aditya II, he introduced he introduced the concept of Navratna. What is the meaning of Navratna? Nine great personalities or nine gems. He had nine gems or nine great personalities at his court. And two of these persons were, okay, two of these persons were, one was Kalidas, the other was, okay, one was Kalidas, the other was uh, Vishakhadat. But apart from these two people, we will talk about these two people and their contributions, especially Kalidas is very, very important. Okay, Kalidas, he takes, he takes, he takes classical Sanskrit literature to a different level altogether. Kalidas, a very, very important person. Now, let's first talk about the other contributions. Okay. For example, Vishakha Datta. Okay. Vishakha Datta, he wrote his major contributions were two works. One was Devi Chandra Guptam and the other was uh, the other was Mudra Rakshasha. Okay. Devi Chandra Guptam is very, very important. See, Devi Chandra Guptam, in Devi Chandra Guptam, Vishakha Datta, he talks about the elder brother according to this book according to uh, devi chandra gupta okay according to devi chandra gupta according to devi chandra gupta cg the second okay chandra go vikram aditya the second and uh, he had an elder brother by the name of ram gupta okay he had an elder brother by the name of ram gupta and he was married to a lady by the name of prabha devi now it so happened that uh, Asaka, okay, Asaka king of that time period, he wanted to marry the wife of Ram Gupta. And Ram Gupta, according to this book, he agreed to that particular wedding. Now, that was like an insult to that particular lady. So, who defended that lady? Chandragu Vikram Aditya. He, it so happened that he went, okay, he went to the camp, okay, he went to the camp of that particular Saka ruler, dressed up like a woman. Okay, he went to the camp of that particular Saka ruler dressed up like a woman and he killed that particular uh, king. So, focus on the name Devi Chandra Guptam. So, uh, Chandra Gupta Vikram Aditya II, okay, he dressed himself like a woman. So, Devi, he became a Devi Chandra Guptam. Okay, and the other work is also very the other work is also very important. Okay, Mudra Rakshasha. The other work is also very important. See, although Mudra Rakshasha was uh, written down during the Gupta period by Vishakha Datta, but it talks about a different era. It talks about the Mauryan period. Basically, the theme of this work is how Chandragupta Maurya, with the help of Chanakya, how they came to power by dislodging the last Nanda ruler Dhananan. Okay, that is the theme of Mudra Rakshasha. Am I clear? Now let's talk about another very important work of this era by the name of Mrich Katika. Okay, what is the English translation of Mrich Katika? Little clay. Okay, little toy cart. Okay, that's the English translation. Little toy cart. And it's a play. Okay, it's a play. And who are the protagonists of this play? Two very, very important people, Charu Datta and Vasant Sena. 
Okay, Charu Datta and Vasant Sena are the two protagonists. So Charu Datta, he happens to be a very wealthy person, but he becomes he is so addicted to all kinds of addictions that he ends up and uh, you know he happens to be a very wealthy person and he has all kinds of vices. Mane bohut teor baya abhya kase teor baya subha bhase. He is into uh, he is a uh, a womanizer also. Okay, he is a charu datta. According to this work, he is a womanizer also, but. He had one good quality. He was very, very generous. They were looking for help, Kaurisle, and that's how, from being a very wealthy person, he became a very poor person. He helped. Okay, he generated. He donated all his wealth to the poor people, and 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 he was a married person also. Okay, he was a married person also. He was a married person also, and but his generosity, the quality of being so generous, attracted another lady, a very, very influential lady of that time by the name of by the name of Vasant Sena. She was a very very influential lady. She was one of the most famous dancers of the time. She was very wealthy. So Vasan Sena, she fell for Charu Datta despite the fact that Charu Datta Charu Datta was a married person. And it is said that according to this book, on a rainy day, on a stormy day, on a rainy stormy day, Vasan Sena went to the home of Charu Datta and proposed. Okay, and proposed to Charu Datta in front of his wife. Now, what is the important takeaway from this work? One important takeaway from this particular incident is that it shows the boldness, it shows the audacity of Vasant Sena, which, in a way, gives us an idea about the condition of women during that time period. Normally, we think that the uh, the condition of women was not so good during the Gupta period, but uh, but Shudraka gives us a completely different picture. You know, history. This is what makes history very, very interesting. Contradictory facts. Normally, we think that condition of women deteriorated. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, in my last lecture also, I told you the same because we have got evidences. Okay, we have got the first epigraphical evidence of sati dating back to this period. So, condition of women was not so good. But if we go by what Charu Datta did, uh, what, what, what? If we go by what uh, uh, Sudraka says in Mrishkatika, he tells us about like completely different thing. Okay, apart from this, apart from this development, how she proposed and all that, what is even more important is that in this particular work, Mrij Katika, Vasant Sena has been described as what Ganika or Nagar Vadhu. Now, these two terms we use for very famous dancers. And why is it important? This piece of information it gives us an idea, or it tells us, it indicates the cosmopolitan nature of this period. Okay. It indicates the urbanized culture or cosmopolitan culture of this time period. Okay, am I clear? Now see. Now let's talk about the most important works of this time period, and those works belong to Kalidas. Now Kalidas, he was a genius. He was he was a very very talented and a very very creative person. And his works can broadly be divided. Okay, we can broadly divide. Uh, Okay, uh, we can broadly we can broadly divide. Okay, we can broadly divide Kalidasa's works into two categories. Okay, we can broadly divide Kalidasa's works into two categories. One would be dramas, one would be dramas. The other would be Mahakavya's or epic poems. Now, if we talk about dramas, the first drama would be uh, Abhigyanam Shakuntalam. The first drama, the first famous drama is. Abhigyanam Shakuntalam, the main protagonist obviously is Shakuntala. Okay, the main protagonist of this drama is Shakuntala. Why is this important? This work is very, very important. Okay, my dear friends, because in 1789, okay, in 1789, sir, okay, in 1789, okay, uh, you must have heard of, you must have heard of Asiatic Society of Bengal, which was founded by Sir William Jones. Sir William Jones founded the Asiatic Society of Bengal in 1784 with the intention of what? With the intention of knowing more about India's culture and history. And in 1789, he translated Malvika Agni Mitra. Uh, I'm so sorry. He translated Abhigyanam Shakuntalam into English. Who translated? Sir William Jones, the founder of Asiatic Society of Bengal. He translated. Okay, he translated Abhigyanam Shakuntalam into English, and the moment that translation happened, the moment that translation happened, Kalidas came to be known as Shakespeare of the East. Okay, apart from it, 
Okay, apart from Abhigyanam, Shakuntalam, Kalidas also wrote another very important drama that is Malvika Agni Mitra, wherein he talks about Agni Mitra. Okay, who is Agni Mitra? Son of Pushya Mitra Shung, Agni Mitra Shung, and he talks about the love story that developed between Agni Mitra and Malvika. Then another very important drama of Kalidas is Vikrama Mor Vashyam, in which he talks about. In which he talks about. This is a fictional tale. Okay, Vikrama Mor Vashyam is a fictional tale. Of a person named Vikram and Urvashi. So this is a fictional love story of Vikram and Urvashi. But many people also say that there is a uncanny. Okay, there is an uncanny and there is a deep. Uh, you know, there is some sort of a resemblance between the Vikram of Vikrama Murvasiam and Chandragu Vikramaditya. Okay, now let's talk about the epic poems of Kalidas. Now, if we talk about the epic poems of Kalidas, okay, first and foremost. Kumar Sambhava. In Kumar Sambhava, Kalidas is talking about whom? Kalidas is talking. Kalidas basically is talking about Lord Kartike and how he defeated Tarkasur. Okay, how he defeated Tarkasur. As we all know, Lord Kartike is the son of Lord Shiva and Goddess Parvati, and this story revolves around how Lord Kartike defeated the demon Tarkasur. Okay, now Raghuvamsha, a very very important work. I'll come to Raghuvamsha again while talking about the important sources that help us reconstruct Assam's history. This is even more important in the context of Assam. Okay, Raghu Vamsha. So basically the word Raghu as we all know, Raghupati Raghava Raja Ram. So the word Raghu means what? Lord Ram and Vamsha or Bongkho. So it talks about the lineage of Lord Ram. Okay, it talks about the lineage of Lord Ram. And Ritu Samhara. See, Ritu Samhara was a completely secular work and in this work, you know, this work reflects how creative a person Kalidas was. Because what was the theme of Ritu Samhara? Okay, Ritu Samhara dealt with or Kalidas wrote about the different emotions. Okay, Kalidas wrote about different emotions that lovers who are in a long distance relationship go through in different seasons. I'll repeat it. Okay, Ritu Samhara talks about different emotions. Okay, Ritu Samhara it talks about different emotions that lovers who are in a long distance relationship go through in different seasons. Ritu. Okay. And the last is Make Dutam. Again, a secular work. I mean, largely secular work in Make Dutam. Who is the protagonist? An employee who works for Lord Kubel. And as we all know, gods, they live in the skies. So an employee of Lord Kubel is thinking how to send a love message, how to send a love message to his uh, love, okay, how to send a love message to his partner and the idea that he came up with was that he could send a love message with the help of a cloud. So he ends up sending a love message through a cloud. So that cloud becomes a messenger for that employee who works for Lord Kubel. That is the theme of Megh Dutam. Megh Dutam. Dut means what? Ambassador or messenger. He acts as a messenger for that person. Okay. Now, in conclusion, we can say that the ancient period, okay, the ancient period, especially the Gupta era, was very crucial. Okay. It was very, very crucial from the perspective of the development of classical Sanskrit literature. From the perspective of the development of the classical Sanskrit literature. Okay. Now, trace the journey. Okay. Trace the journey of the development of the Dravida school of temple architecture. So before we proceed any further, let me just quickly, okay, let me just quickly draw for you what does Dravida school of temple architecture look like, okay. See, so basically, uh, what is Dravida school of temple architecture? So basically, there are two major types of temples, uh, there are two major types of temple styles, okay, there are two major types of what? There are two major types of schools of temple architecture that are being followed in India. Two major types. Okay, one is what? One is Nagara style of temple architecture, and the other is Dravida style. Two major styles of temple architecture. Nagara style of temple architecture is largely confined to North India, 
and Dravida style is largely confined to South India. And a mixture of both, if you combine the elements of both Nagara and Dravida, you will get another form of temple architecture that is known as what? Besara style of or school of temple architecture. Okay. Now see the Dravidian school of temple architecture. Okay. Looks like this primarily. And in order to understand the difference between Dravida, okay, Dravida style of temple architecture and Nagara, see, the difference is largely in what? In the, in the structure, okay, this is what? This is Nagara. And this is what? Dravida. See, where does, the, where does the difference lie? The difference largely lies in the structure, the structure which you will find atop this. Okay, this structure. What is this structure known as? This structure is known as Garbha Griha. Garbha Griha. The most sacred part of a temple. The most sacred part of a temple where idols are kept. Zotumar. Moti Sthapana Kora Hoi. That part is known as what? Garbha Griha. In English we call it what? Sanctum Sanctorum Boli Kovami. Okay. In English we call it what? Sanctum Sanctorum. So, in Nagara style also same. It is known as what? Garbha Griha. Okay sir. So, as far as Garbha Griha is concerned. Okay. There is no difference in Garbha Griha. The difference is where? The difference in the structure which lies above Garbha Griha. Swa, this is Dravida and this is Nagara. Swa, and this, this structure which lies above the Garbha Griha in Nagara style is known as what? Shikhar. Shikhar. And in Dravida style we call it what? Viman. I am mentioning Viman because we will come across the word Viman in the answer also. So before we come across, I'm telling you beforehand. When I say Viman, this structure is known as Viman. And when I say Viman, I'm talking about what? Dravidian. Okay, I'm talking about Dravidian style of temple architecture. The same structure in the case of Nagara style is known as what? Shikhar. But the question is of Dravidian style. Because now that, now that we have understood the difference, now let's quickly go back to the answer. Now see. The question is, trace the journey of the development, okay? Trace the journey of the development of what? Development of the Dravida school of temple architecture. Okay, sir? See, Dravida school of temple architecture is one of the two broad categories of temple style, okay? Being followed in India, like I say. This style, now see, who were the originators of Dravida school of temple architecture? The, the Pallava dynasty. The Pallava dynasty which came to power in around 550 CE. They were whose contemporaries? They were the contemporaries of the Chalukyan dynasty. Okay, the Pallava dynasty, the Pallavas came to power around 550 CE. They remained in power till around 900 CE. Okay, they were the originators. They were the originators of South Indian temple architecture which is also known as what? Dravidian style of temple architecture. They were the originators. Because, and how did they originate? They originated with cave temples. They originated Etiyami Porhim. Okay. The construction or the journey of South Indian temples or Dravidian style of temple architecture started with what? Started with cave temples. Okay. Guha Manadhara rock cut cave temples. Okay. Hill Kati Kati Bonua temples will like rock cut. Tar Pisot Lahe 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 we get to hear of something or we get to see something known as freestanding temples. But freestanding temples, that is freely stand correct without any support. Unlike the rock, uh, unlike the cave uh, 
temples. Figure that. So, Pallavas Bilage initially, initially they started with something called cave paintings and slowly and steadily they moved toward freestanding temples. Okay, and then once they moved to freestanding temples, the other dynasties who came after the Pallavas, they also contributed. Okay, they also contributed handsome. They also contributed handsomely. Okay, they also made a lot of contributions to the further development of the Dravidian style of temple architecture. Like the Cholas, like the Vijayanagara, like the Pandyas. Okay, now Swa. The Dravidian temples, they started like I said as cave temples. But with time they graduated to what? Freestanding temples. Okay, now so if we talk about cave temples, okay, if we talk about cave temples, cave temples can be divided into two things. Cave temples can be divided into two things, and those two things are what? Rathas. Okay, those two things are what? Mandaps and Rathas. Mandaps and Rathas. So basically, Mandaps, okay. What is Mandaps? Mandap is a very good example of a cave temple. So to me, Guhaira Dhumaisa, that Guha itself is a temple. Understand it like this. Okay, hey Guha to Bhidorite Dunya Dunya ke carving kora hoy se. Okay, decoration papa to me. Temple. Mane it's a temple, no doubt about it. It's a temple. But temple inside a cave. That is the meaning of a Mandap. Thikha se temple inside a cave. Alveta bostu kiya hai. In the same category, in the category of cave temple is Rathas. Very very important, okay? Rathas. In fact, a very famous Pallava ruler by the name of Narsing Burman, he constructed seven Rathas at Mamallapuram. He constructed seven Rathas. Rathas bila ki hoi? These are monolithic temples. Okay, what is the meaning of monolithic? Built out of a single rock. Okay, built out of a single rock. Okay, what is the meaning of monolithic? Built out of a single rock. A, Rathas Villa, these are monolithic structures. Okay, Rathas Villa, monolithic structures. I'll show you. Okay, I'll show you a picture of Rathas. Just give me one second. See, these are the Rathas I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. See, this is what I'm talking about, okay? These are the Rathas. Can you see this? This is what I'm talking about. All these are all these are examples of Rathas, okay? This is a Ratha, this is a Ratha, this is a Ratha, this is a Ratha. All these are separate Rathas. Okay, I hope I'm clear. Now, see, these Rathas, like I said, were monolithic shrines and, like I said, Narsing Varman, he built how many? Seven Rathas in Mamallapuram. In fact, this place, focus on this name, Mamallapuram. Mamallapuram, okay, Mamallapuram is, is, it is, it is, it is also known as Mahabalipuram. It is very close, it is, it is very close to Chennai. Okay, Mamallapuram or Mahabalipuram. Okay, in fact, this city itself, this city of Mahabalipuram or Mamallapuram itself was founded by Narsing Burman. Okay, that hey Sohor Kunu Teme Ponaisil. That city was also founded by Narsing Burman. Okay. See the period. Now let's come to the era of what freestanding temples. Now we have talked about the era of what cave temples. Now let's talk about the era of freestanding temples. Mane, what is the meaning of freestanding temples? Uh, freestanding mane ki a leap or a step towards constructing freestanding temples was taken when Rathas were constructed. Rathas bila ko ki? Rathas, mane, the moment Rathas were constructed, it was a step towards the construction of freestanding temples. Kindu proper freestanding temples, hoi utha na sile. Zodiyo Rathas, it was a step towards the construction of freestanding temples. Kindu Rathas bila ko kami? Excellent examples of freestanding temples ami kobun maru. The actual era of the construction of freestanding temples, it began, okay, it, 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 you know, it, 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 it mainly, it mainly, uh, the actual era when this type of temple architecture got developed in South India, this is the era, from 700 to 900 CE, okay, this was, this was the time period which saw the emergence of what, freestanding temples, this was the time period. 
Now a prominent style of this period or ekini homoyor at a prominent style was what? Raj Simha style. Or where Raj Simha style emerged at a time when Pallavas were at the peak of their power. When Pallavas were at the peak of their power. When they were most powerful. When no other kingdom was as powerful as the Pallavas in South India. Okay. There was a time, for example, Pallavas had become very powerful. Okay, there was a time, for example, Nursing Burman. Okay, Nursing Burman had defeated Pulakashita II also. Okay, and we uh, already talked about how powerful Pulakashita II was. Okay, Pulakashita II had defeated whom? Harsha Vardhana. Now, Nursing Burman is a Pallava ruler, so they were very powerful. So, this Raj Simha style, this Raj Simha style emerged at a time when Pallavas were at the peak of their power. Okay, when they were at the peak of their power. So obviously, when they were at the peak of their power, obviously you will get to see a lot of good things. Because, what does it mean by they were at the peak of their power? So when anyone is at the peak of their power, obviously he will have, what? He will have access to a large amount of resources. He will be rich. Okay, he will be rich. He will have a lot of money. Obviously. So, a prominent style was Raja Simha and two of the most important examples Okay, two of the most important examples of temples belonging to this time period are number one, Shore Temple. Okay, Shore Temple at Mamallapuram and Kailashnath Temple at Kanchipuram. By the way, Kanchipuram, okay, this place, okay, Kanchipuram also used to be the capital of the Pallavas. Kanchipuram, which is in Tamil Nadu, used to be the capital of the Pallavas. So, you will find a very important temple by the name of Kailash Nath Temple. Okay, Kailash Nath Temple, which is at Kanchipuram. And Shore Temple at Mamallapuram. Okay. See, what is one of the biggest contributions of the Pallavas? One of the biggest contributions of the Pallavas was the introduction of order of columns. Okay, order of columns. I'll show you just one just one second. History needs to be understood in the form of pictures at times. See, something like this. See, order of columns. As you can see, the pillars are standing in a proper order, in a proper row. Can you see this? Can you see this? The pillars, they are standing in a proper row or a proper order. This is known as the order of columns. Okay, this is known as what? Order of columns. Okay, and in South India, and in South India, it was introduced by whom? It was introduced in South Indian temples. It was introduced by the Pallavas. They are known for introducing this order of columns. And this is considered to be their biggest contribution. See the columns. We have keep on columns. Okay. Or the pillars. Or the order of columns of pillars. Okay. Pillar So they are standing in a proper row or order. A order to who introduced it in South Indian temples? The Pallavas. And this remains to be one of their biggest contributions. In South Indian temple architecture. Okay. See now, <clears throat> the Pallavas, although although they introduced this order of pillars, the concept of order of pillars, the temples were smaller. The Pallavas, Pallavas or under a Zumbilak, Mondir Hoysil Hebilak, they were smaller in size. But having said that, they were richly decorated. Small hobo pare, but they were richly decorated. The temples used to have a lot of ornamentation and decoration. But, okay, the size of the South Indian temples started becoming bigger under the imperial Cholas. Okay, the Chola dynasty. So, Chola dynasty. Okay, recently a movie had come by the name of PS1. The PS1 movie was based on Raja Raja Chola. Now, he will become the Raja Raja Chola. Okay, this Chola dynasty, very, very important Chola dynasty. We call them imperial Cholas because at one point in time, much of Sri Lanka was also under their control. Okay, their influence was not just confined to Sri Lanka, but their influence also got extended to regions like Southeast Asia. 
such was the might of imperial chola so obviously if they had such a might if they were so powerful if they had such might so their temples will also be bigger so their temples the south indian temples became bigger okay under the cholas and which part of the temple became bigger basically remember the viman okay remember the viman this 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 part of the temple okay this part i am talking about this part the viman this part of the temple became taller and taller are you more like goes okay this part of the temple became what taller and taller this part of the temple this viman it became taller and taller okay see the viman became taller okay for example if we talk about the viman and one of the most important temples okay one of the most important temples of this time period is what the brihadeshwara temple temple dedicated to lord shiva okay brihadeshwara temple is considered to be the most beautiful example it is considered to be the most beautiful or you can say one of the most beautiful examples of dravidian style of temple architecture and the viman the viman of this temple what is the height of the viman of this temple 66 meters in height just imagine so that was what i was referring to when i said that the vimans became taller under the cholas apart from this the cholas also introduced gopurams they also introduced what the cholas they also introduced gopurams what is the meaning of gopurams gopurams mean gateways theek hai sir gopurams okay they were the ones okay gopurams were not a feature of the temple or they were not a feature of the pallavan style of temple architecture okay they were introduced by the cholas gopurams mane ki gateways gate bila theek hai sir and apart from this apart from this the apart from this cholas bila ke ki korisil cholas bila ke they also introduced or they also started building several other things inside the temple complex so inside the temple complex there will be the main shrine main temple to thaki boy main temple to obviously thaki boy main temple to pallavas under to asile but now cholas will also introduce certain other features okay like for example uh, residential quarters for the priest of the temple like for example water tank and like for example administrative office ebila bostu tahati they started building all these okay they started building all these things within the temple complex theek ase then came the pandya so cholas bila kor pisot who became the most powerful group in south india in deep south i'm talking about the pandyas okay pandyas became more powerful okay pandyas became more powerful but obviously they were uh, you know you know i mean obviously they had to face the uh, invasion okay unfortunately they had to face the invasion of malik kafur who was malik kafur he was the commander of alauddin khilji but until then they had prospered a lot okay they had prospered a lot and what is one special feature of the pandyan style of temple architecture what did they introduce okay what did they introduce to dravidian style of temple architecture they gopurams if you look at the gopurams of the pandyan temples okay if you look at the gopurams of the temples that developed under the pandyas the gopurams were or the gateways were even taller than the vimans vimanot koyu tumar beshi ukho ki hoy jay gopuram ki hor karne what could be what could be the possible reason the possible reason is this this was also the time of islamic invasions okay this was also the time of islamic invasions or invasions and therefore they were using the gopurams as what watch towers to keep a tab on who is coming towards us to keep a tab to keep a tab on the enemy movement to observe the enemy movement so under the pandyas the point i'm trying to make here is gopurams began to be used as watch towers okay they began to be used as what watch towers theek hai sir now now the next important power is Vijayanagara Empire. Okay, Vijayanagara Empire. When I say Vijayanagara Empire, they were the contemporaries of Muhammad bin Tughlaq. In fact, it was under his rule while he was still the Sultan. Vijayanagara Empire came to power around 1536 CE. Okay, sir. So idea. Now, Vijayanagara Empire. It is considered to be the pinnacle. Okay, Vijayanagara Empire. It became very very prosperous. Okay, its prosperity, its prosperity, its its its. Manehora, its wealth. 
its prosperity has also been attested by many foreign chroniclers okay like nicolo conti now nicolas conti now so uh, and and also domingo pease he was another foreign traveler who had visited the vijayanagara empire and he was in all praise of the empire now vijayanagara empire so it is considered to be the pinnacle of what pinnacle of temple architecture of south india and what were their contributions what did they contribute okay what were their unique contributions first of all amman shrine see this word amman shrine in the temples that developed under the vijayanagara empire for example there is this very famous temple although uh, you know it has not you know although it has not survived the uh, you know it is not in an intact form or now it is now it is now it is now it is in an intact form but it had to face the uh, it has to face what it has to face the you know uh, events of time okay now a very very important uh, temple is what virupaksh temple okay virupaksh temple was a temple which was built okay which was built around this time period and it is located in hampi in karnataka okay hampi in karnataka okay so if you are what you will find in the temples which were constructed under the vijayanagara rulers for example amman shrine what was this amman shrine what was this amman shrine amman shrine was they used to do what they used to construct a separate shrine okay shrine means what let's say a temple they used to construct a separate temple for the chief goddess they used to construct a separate temple for the wife okay let's say for the wife of the chief deity they used to construct a separate temple for the wife okay let's say for example if the if the main temple is dedicated to lord shiva then they will also construct a separate temple for goddess parvati so they had they had a separate shrine for the wife of the chief god amman shrine okay that was what amman shrine kalyan mandap a very very important thing which they had introduced now kalyan mandap was a mandap it was a structure which was used by the vijayanagara rulers okay it was used by the vijayanagara rulers to marry the chief god okay it was a kalyan mandap that marriage ceremonies okay between the chief god and the chief goddess used to take place kalyan means what kalyan the word kalyan itself means marriage so it was a mandap where they used to conduct the 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 the, the you know the the marriage between the chief god and the chief goddess and with time kalyan mandap was also used okay it was also used to conduct the marriage between the vijayanagara king and the and of course the queen so with time kalyan mandap was also used by the vijayanagara kings for their personal marriages okay kalyan mandap and also maha navami dikka very very important it is what it was a nine step platform okay it is a nine step platform and according to scholars according to scholars many religious festivals must have happened on this particular platform okay many religious festivals also we cannot say anything for sure anything with certainty but according to scholars why we cannot say anything with certainty because in the battle of talikota which took place in 1565 the capital of the vijayanagara empire that was what vijayanagara it was totally burned down by the deccani sultanates golconda bijapur ahmednagar berar and bidar okay they had totally destroyed okay for many different reasons now i am not going into those reasons but they had totally burned down the capital of the vijayanagara empire and most of the temples were located in the capital city okay so we have an we have an we do not have many traces of those temples so we cannot say much about that particular era but we have okay we have discovered something known as maha navami dikka nine step platform but luckily luckily although they were able to destroy the city but how can they destroy how can they destroy the writings okay how can they destroy the things which have been written by foreign chroniclers how can they destroy that okay they cannot destroy that many foreign many many foreign travelers like i mentioned earlier they have talked about the prosperity they have talked about the uh, they have talked about vijayanagara empire how prosperous they were how wealthy they were what were their contributions in the field of art and architecture okay so in conclusion okay in conclusion what can we say in conclusion we can say that 
<coughs> from cave temples to grand free standing temples the journey of dravidal school of temple architecture came a long way okay came a long way uh, the temples of south india are full of they are full of beautiful sculptures the temple of south india are full of beautiful sculptures and ornamentation was present ornamentation means what ornamentation means decoration okay ornamentation means what decoration ornamentation was present in these temples from the time of pallavan era itself like i said under the cholas mural paintings were also witnessed on the temple walls okay for example if you go to the brihadeshwara temple okay which is largely considered to be the pinnacle of the dravidian school of temple architecture you will see a very famous painting of raja raja chola who had built the brihadeshwara temple raja raja chola okay raja raja chola because of which brihadeshwara temple is also known as raja rajeshwara temple so if you go to the brihadeshwara temple you will see a picture of raja raja chola along with his wives okay along with his wives they are uh you know and you will also in the same picture you will also see uh ddd the guru of raja raja chola and this picture is considered to be the example of the first royal portrait in you know in the in the in the history of indian paintings first example of royal portrait theek hai sir see give a detailed account of the moidam architecture of assam a very very important question give a detailed account of the moidam architecture of assam okay give a detailed account of the moidam architecture of assam now we all know okay why this question is important this time because as we all know government of india okay government of india has nominated the soraido moidams government of india has nominated the soraido moidams for the unesco world heritage site tag so this becomes very very important for us so we have to know about the moidams in a all of us we have a rough idea about what moidams are but we have to go into a bit more detail okay we have to do a detailed study about the moidams see the moidams as we all know they were the they were the burial places okay they were the burial places of ahom kings nobles okay they were the burial places of ahom kings queens and the nobles okay they were the burial places because the moidams is also associated with the ancient tradition of the ahoms okay initially they were not hindus initially they were not hindus so moidam is something which is associated with what they used to believe once upon a time they they may no longer believe in uh, the construction of moidams or they may no longer believe in tai ahom beliefs okay they may no longer believe in gods like for example they may no longer believe in gods like langdong but that does not mean moidams or langdong is no no longer important they are very very important we have to understand this okay we have to understand this okay so so and back then when they used to when all the ahoms used to believe in ancient tai ahom beliefs back then they used to bury the dead back then they used to what bury the dead and and moidam is something which is associated with that particular custom of burying the dead Am I clear? See, now I mean obviously, moidams. Which time this line is important? They have also become a place of veneration. Meaning, I mean, they have also become a place of veneration. Meaning, I mean, or a they have also become a place of veneration. Meaning, they are worthy of respect. They are not supposed to be insulted. You know, it's very very insulting to go and sit on a moidam. Sometimes I see people sitting on a moidam. I mean, obviously, they cannot do this in the Choraido Moidams, but there are many more Moidams. Moidams are scattered across Upper Assam. Okay, sometimes I see. Okay, and but that should not be done. Okay, Moidams are a place of veneration. Okay, no one should sit on top of the Moidams, and that has largely happened because we have failed to maintain those Moidams. For example, there were two Moidams at. Okay, there were two very famous Moidams at Borborwa in Dibrugar, but. we have not been able to maintain those moidams in the in a proper manner or in a way we should have maintained those moidams because sir so anyway and so they have become a place of veneration why because they have become a place of veneration mane ki deep respect okay deep respect aru because it is something which has an association with the ahom belief of ancestor worship okay the ancient ahom belief of ancestor worship okay they believed okay they believed that after their near and dear ones 
died. Okay, they they became what? They became dams. What is the meaning of dam spirit? They became dams or they became guardians. They believe that after their death, they will become guardians and they will look after their families. So the concept of ancestral worship, the concept of ancestral worship was a very, very important part of the ancient Tayaung beliefs. Okay, sir? And if you see, if you see the structure called Moidam also makes sense. Okay, it also makes sense because it is also believed Along with the kings, along with the kings and queens, a lot of day-to-day -day articles which were used by the kings and queens were also buried along with them. That shows what? That shows they also believed in the concept of afterlife. And if you remember in my last lecture, I also told you that the people of IBC also must have believed in the concept of afterlife because we have found certain graves. Because as far as graves are concerned, we have found a diverse number of graves, okay, different types of graves. But some graves are what? Okay, in certain graves, we have also found that certain items were buried along with the dead. So that means what? They also used to believe in life after death. So the fact that they are, okay, the fact that in the Moidams, they are burying articles of day-to-day -day use and also items of luxury along with the dead. That indicates their belief in the concept of what? Life after death okay see uh, now let's understand the moidam architecture now let's understand the moidam architecture the word moidam okay the word moidam is derived the word moidam is derived from the thai word very very important okay it is derived from the thai word what is thai thai like for example thai ahom okay thai is a thai is a language okay thai is a language Thai Ahom. Now, I mean, obviously the Ahoms now are, are trying to revive the Thai language because once upon a time they used to speak in Thai language. But the Ahoms, as we all know, uh, you know, you know, for the for the for the uh, greater sake, okay, for the greater sake, or uh, in a bid to assimilate, okay, in a bid to assimilate completely with the greater Asme society, they had to forego their own language. As a result of which, their language now faces the danger of extinction. But Fortunately, they have taken steps to revive the Thai language, but it's a very important language. See, the word Moidam is derived from the Thai word Frang Moidam. Okay? There's a Thai word by the name of Frang Moidam, where the word Frang means to what? Where the word Frang means to bury. Okay? Where the word Frang means to bury, and Dam, like I already said, it means what? Spirit of the dead. So, Moidam. Okay? Moidam. Bury the spirit of the dead. Okay? See, though Moidams, like I said, they are largely scattered throughout the Parasam. Okay, they are largely scattered. You will find Moidams in Jurhat, you will find Moidams in uh, Hiwahagar, Soraido, you will also find Moidams, like I said, in Dibrugan. Because though Moidams are largely scattered throughout Upper Assam, throughout Upper Assam, the royal Moidams are concentrated in Soraido district. What's the meaning of royal Moidams? Royal Moidams, Manedora Moidams of kings and queens. And, I mean, also, we may also include the most powerful nobles. They were graves. But, let me clarify, Moidams were not just graves. They were much more than graves. Okay? So, the Royal Moidams are largely located in the Soraido district. The Royal Moidams are also located in the Soraido district, including the Moidam of Sukafa. Okay? Including the Moidam of Saulung Sukafa. Because, but Saulung Sukafa's Moidam is not located within the complex of the Moidams which have now been uh, or let's say which have now been nominated for the UNESCO World Heritage uh, Tag. Okay. It is located in Sorido district itself, but it is not located within that complex. Okay. Saulung Sukafa. And then you know in some other class I will also go into the meaning. I will also go into the epitomology. Okay, I will also go into the uh, I will also go into the meaning of the word Soraido. Okay? See, like I said, recently the government of India is nominated. Okay? Now let's talk about the architecture. The body of the Moidans, like most of us know, is hemispherical in shape. Okay? The exterior body, okay? The exterior part of the Moidam is hemispherical shape. Okay, something like a stupa you can say. Okay, something like a stupa. I will come to stupa. Okay, and their sizes. 
you know you must have noticed one thing that not all the sizes of all the moidams are similar okay some moidams are big the other moidams are smaller okay for example the royal moidams are generally bigger than the either uh, than the other moidams why because the size of the moidam also depends on who has been buried okay the size of the moidam also depends on the person who has been buried obviously if that is the moidam of a king that moidam obviously will be bigger than the moidam of let's say a prince okay sir it's common sense so the size also kept on varying from moidam to moidam and if we talk about the main parts of a big moidam okay see these parts are not present in each and every moidam the parts i'm going to talk about now the parts i'm going to talk about now these parts are not present in each and every moidam okay but these are essentially present in all the important and big moidams okay see first of all a vault what is the meaning of a vault a vault means a chamber okay this is the part this is that place okay this is that particular place in a moidam where the coffin where the coffin uh, which has the dead body inside it is being kept because as unto coffin or dead body thake a dead body to vault or khumai a vault or chamber and in thai ahom language it is known as what kareng rungdang this particular vault or a chamber is the most essential part of a moidam because eventually the coffin goes under this vault it is known as what kareng rungdang because okay, then a coffin like i said the dead body is first put inside a coffin and then the coffin has been put inside that particular chamber or a vault and that coffin in thai ahom language is known as what rungdang okay rungdang and okay after after closing the door of the vault they used to build a hemispherical mound okay they used to build an earthen mound they used to build an earthen mound and that particular earthen mound is built over the chamber and apart from this mound there was also a gateway okay there was also a boundary wall i'm so sorry there was also a boundary wall kind of a thing which was built at the base okay which was built at the base of the mound is a earthen mound they banai sel okay now a boundary wall will be constructed at the base of the uh, you know uh, earthen mound and that boundary wall will have an arched gateway okay will have an arched gateway what is the meaning of arch arch means something like this this structure is known as arch okay this is known as what arch okay sir this is known as arch okay sir a bosulo a shape to arch boli kor so an arch gateway will also be present in the okay uh, an arch gateway was also present in that particular boundary wall which was constructed at the base of the mound okay now if we go by the ahom burunjis the ahom burunjis also say the ahom burunjis say that earlier earlier the walls or the chambers used to be made of what earlier the walls or the chambers used to be made of they they were they were made of wood okay they were made of wood they were the the principal building material the principal building material of the wall or the chamber okay it got the principal building material got replaced with brick and stone from the time of from the time of the great ahom king rudrohingo okay from the time of the great ahom king rudrohingo now let me tell you something very very interesting you know as per burundis only two clans were allowed to bury the ahom king only two clans mane thoda now i'm talking about ahom clans see ahom is a tribe a, then that particular tribe was divided into many clans ঠিক আছে but only two clans but only two clans where and even among those two clans okay even among those two clans we hear of something called khels okay what is the meaning of khels khel is something which is connected with pike system also okay khel is when you assign a group of people to a particular task when you assign a group of people to a particular task that becomes a khel okay khel is something which can be compared with guild system of ancient india guild system tha ke each khel had to do a particular kind of a job for example ghiloi dhari okay the ghiloi dhari khel it was into what i mean it was into gun making thik hai sir it was into gun making so 
there were two khels okay people from those two khels for example uh, and those two khels were what those two khels were gharfolia khel and lukura khan khel only people belonging to these two khels gharfolia khel and lukura khan khel were allowed to bury the king and they were only allowed okay only people from these two khels were also allowed no one else was allowed to carry the coffin okay only people from these two clans were allowed to carry the coffin okay to carry the coffin carrying the dead body of the king till the place of burial kahati o kol dangi nibo parisil and the road which they took the road which they took while carrying the coffin they have to take a road hoy na no the coffin has to be carried to the site of burial the road tahati sundor rasta used korisil that rasta came to be known as honia ali okay that uh, that 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 honia ali that road came to be known as honia ali okay sir and before you know before the final rites okay before the final rites a ritualistic bathing was also done okay before the final rites a ritualistic or let's say before uh, putting the body okay before putting the dead body in that particular coffin a ritualistic bath was also done and that particular ritualistic bath was done at a place by the name of ho dhua pukhuri the meaning of ho means what dead body and dhua means washing and here niya means what to take ho niya ali and ho dhua pukhuri okay in conclusion we can say that moidans they are a remain of the glorious past okay they are a remain of the glorious past of assam they are a remain of the glorious past of assam they have also been compared the moidams they have also been compared you know they have also been compared with whom they have also been compared to the pyramids of egypt so it's such a big comparison and you will find it amazing okay you will find it fascinating to know that nowhere else in india nowhere else in india we get to see something as close to moidams mane nowhere else in india we get to see something we get to see something like moidams moidams are a unique thing okay they are intrinsic to assam moidams are intrinsic to assam if we talk about india okay and even if we talk about the entire world moidams are not something which you will get to see in south asia primarily yes of course if you if you if you talk about south east asia then you may find you may find similar structures okay <coughs> so so now uh, i said this already the day to day articles were also buried along with the dead in both the cases in the case of pyramids also in the case of moidams also now i mean obviously with the increasing influence of hinduism okay as more and more ahom kings accepted hinduism as more and more ahoms became hindus with the increasing influence of hinduism among the ahoms the practice of burying the dead okay the practice of burying the dead in the form of moidams it was largely discarded okay it was done away with they were no they were no longer following that practice they were no longer following that practice they had largely discarded the practice of what burying their dead by building moidams because now they have become hindus now they have started cremating the dead theek hai sir but but this is very very interesting even today even today a small section okay even today a small section of the ahoms practice this particular custom even today a small section of the ahoms mainly i am talking about the priestly class if i have to talk about the priestly class of ahoms of the tai ahom there are three okay there are mainly three priestly classes bailongs mohans and deodhais bailongs mohans and deodhais these are the three priestly classes of the ahom so the uh, the, the, the 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 concept of burying the dead in the form of moidams is still prevalent among these three priestly classes and it is prevalent among another ahom clan by the name of saudam okay saudam they used to be royal guards okay they used to be what they used to be royal bodyguards now highlight the important literary sources that help in reconstructing the history of assam very very important okay literary sources like we all know there are a great source for historiography okay literary sources they are a great source for historiography the literary sources are a great source for 
हिस्टोरियोग्राफी ओके दे गिव अस एन आइडिया अबाउट द पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ टाइम बिसाइड्स शेडिंग लाइट ऑन द सोशियो इकोनॉमिक कंडीशन ओके नाउ सी given below are some of the most important literary works that help us reconstruct assam's past okay given below are some of the most important literary works that help us reconstruct assam's past see shatpatha brahmana what is shatpatha brahmana shatpatha brahmana is a part of vedic literature okay so brahmanas what were what are brahmanas basically they are commentaries on the vedas and this particular brahmana known as Shatpatha Brahmana. It's the Brahmana of Yajur Ved. It talks about what? It talks about the extension of the Aryan culture up to River Karatoya. Okay, Karatoya. This River Karatoya is very very important from the perspective of ancient. Uh, let's say from the perspective of ancient Assam, because Karatoya, it is believed that it was the boundary of ancient Assam. Where does this river flow today? It flows in. I mean, it originates in the Jalpaiguri district of West Bengal and it flows into Bangladesh. ठीक है सर, so so Aryan culture up to river Karatoya, ठीक है सर, then if we talk about Mahabharata, okay, one of the epics, one of the इतिहासास Mahabharata, it talks about भगवतो in great detail, it talks about uh, it praises, it praises the courage, okay, it praises the uh, it talks about the valor of भगवतो, the way he participated in the battle of Kurukshetra along with his army of Chinas and Kiratas, okay. so it talks about that part and while talking about that part it also helps us it also gives us an idea about that point okay and bhagadatta who was bhagadatta bhagadatta he was he is he is okay he is one of the traditional kings of assam but just because we do not have enough historical sources we cannot brush aside bhagadatta because because in guwahati right in the middle of guwahati there is a tank okay there is a pond by the name of there is a very famous pond by the name of digoli pukuri some scholars are of the opinion that digoli pukuri was constructed was initially excavated this tank by none other than bhagadatta himself okay apart from that we have got many places we have got a few places if not many in guwahati named after bhagadatta for example in kahili para itself you will find a street by the name of bhagadatta And Bhagadatta, by the way, was the son of Narakasur. And in Kahili Para again, you will also find an area which has been named after Narakasur. So these are the things which have kept these kings alive, although they are part of the traditional history of Assam. Okay, sir. So Bhagadatta has been mentioned in Mahabharata. And Kalidas, obviously, Kalidas also talks about ancient Assam. Okay, Raghuvamsha. See, one of the works I was talking about Raghuvamsha earlier. Now I'll talk about it again. Raghuvamsha, one of the Works of Kalidas. Okay, one of the works of Kalidas. In that Raghu Vamsha, Kalidas says that Raghu's son named Aja. Okay, the son of Raghu named Aja. He conducted his wedding, and in that particular wedding, who was his? Who was his best man? Mane Dora Dora. Who was his Dora Dora best man? The king of Kamru. That goes to show what? That goes to show the importance of Kamru. That goes to show the importance of Kamru in mainstream Indian politics. Okay, see that Kalhana's Raja Tarangini. Okay, he talks about the marriage which happened between the Kamrupi princess Amrit Prabha and the ruler of Kashmir by the name of Megha Bahan. Why is this important? Because after going to Kashmir, after going to Kashmir, Amrit Prabha builds a Buddhist monastery. Not just that, she also, while going to Kashmir, she also takes along with her a Tibetan Buddhist monk by the name of Stunpa. and who was stunpa stunpa was the religious guru of bala varman who was bala varman father of amrit prabha that goes to show what that goes to show that buddhism was present in ancient assam during that part of time mane during that part of history also during that time period also buddhism was very much present in assam and that contradicts that contradicts the picture which has been given by hyuen sang a bit later when hyuen sang comes to assam Okay, when Hyuen Sang comes to Assam in the seventh century CE, he tells us that he could not see any signs of Buddhism in Assam. Only Devas he could see. Maybe he is true, maybe he is false. But during the time of Bala Varman, we get to see a completely different picture. And Bala Varman came much before the arrival of Hyuen Sang. By the way, Bala Varman he belongs to the great Varman dynasty of ancient Kamru. Okay. Now the Kalika Puran. Okay. Kalika Puran is one of the 
most important Puranas. In fact, Kalika Puran was composed in ancient Kamrup. It was composed in around 10th century CE. And it's a very vital source. It tells us about the socio-economic conditions of the people of ancient Kamrup. Then, Buddhist literature. Okay, We have a kind of Buddhist literature emerging from places like Tibet, Nepal and Bhutan. And this Buddhist literature, this Buddhist literature hails Haju as the place it tells that haju was the place where gautam buddha attained mahaparinibbana what is the meaning of mahaparinibbana in simple words death so you see there's a very famous temple at haju by the name of hoyogriva madhav temple this is the reason why hoyogriva madhav temple is also very popular among a section of buddhist okay sir see then persian chronicles now if we talk about persian chronicles there are three Persian chronicles which are very very important. Okay, there are three Persian chronicles which are very very important. There are three Persian chronicles which are very very important. Tabakat in Nasiri. Okay, Tabakat in Nasiri. It has been composed by Minhaji Siraj. Tabakat in Nasiri has been composed by Minhaji Siraj. Why is this important, Tabakat in Nasiri? Because it re it reconfirms what. It reconfirms the defeat. It reconfirms the defeat of it reconfirms the defeat of Bhaktiar Khilji when Bhaktiar Khilji invaded Assam around in around 1206 CE. He is said to have been defeated by Raja Prithu of ancient Kamru. Now we know about this from Kanoi Borokhibua rock inscription. But the same thing gets repeated in Tabakat in Nasiri. When Minhaji Siraj also reconfirms, he also says the same thing that Bhaktiar Kilji got defeated at the hands of Raja Prithu. In fact, the Raja Prithu word has not been used in Kanoi Boroki word rock inscription. The Raja Prithu, I mean, called Raja Prithu. Okay, it is Minhaji Siraj who uses the word Raja Prithu or Rai Prithu. Okay, then there is Baharistani Gaibi. Baharistani Gaibi again is an account of places like Assam and Bengal and it was composed under the rule of Jahangir okay and it was composed by a person by the name of Mirza Nathan and and there's another very important source by the name of by the name of uh, Fatiha e Ibriya okay Fatiha e Ibriya which was composed by Shihabuddin Talish and Fatiha e Ibriya mainly talks about Mir Jumla's invasion of Assam okay Mir Jumla's invasion of Assam okay and Shihabuddin Talish when he comes to Assam along with Mir Jumla he this book is very very valuable not just from the point of view of that particular invasion but Shihabuddin Talish in this particular book Fatiha Ibriya he also talks about the beauty and strength of the Kalengor. He also talks about the beauty and strength of the Gorgao Palace. Okay, He also talks about the beauty and strength of the Gorgao Palace. Okay, for example, a descriptive account of Assam. Okay, a descriptive account of Assam of 1841 by William Robinson. What is the importance of this book? A descriptive account of Assam. It has a lot of importances. Okay, it is, it is, it is, you know, I mean, it has a lot of utility. But in this particular book, William Robinson also gives a vivid description. He also gives a vivid description about the gold washing industry of Assam and how Sonwal Kosaris were playing a very very crucial role in it. You know, Sonwal Kosaris were gold washing experts. That's how they, they were organized by the Ahom kings. They were organized into a khel by the name of Sonwal Khel. And that's how they got the name of what? Sonwal Kosaris. Okay? Then obviously account of Captain Welsh. Who was Captain Welsh? Captain Welsh came to Assam. Okay, Captain Welsh came to Assam on being invited by Ahom King Gorinath Hingo. And when he came to Assam, later he also played a key role in, in suppressing the Muamoria rebellions. Okay, he played a key role. And Captain Welsh, when he came to Assam, he has left a very interesting account of Assam. So this account is also very, very important. Now in conclusion, we can say that, you know, starting from ancient Assam, Okay, starting from ancient Assam till the time Assam was under the control of the British. Okay, literary works refer to this place again and again. See, they are referring to Assam again and again. That means Assam has been an important place ever since antiquity. Ever since antiquity. Okay, through them it becomes easier for us to know our past. Okay, 
Now let's go to the next question. See, give a detailed description of the stupa architecture. Okay, give a detailed description of the stupa architecture. Now, Swa, stupas. Okay, what are stupas? Stupas are one of the most important places of worship. Stupas are one of the most important places of worship and veneration for the Buddhists. They are one of the most important places of worship and veneration for the Buddhists. And what do they contain? They, 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 they either contain bodily remains. They either contain bodily remains of Buddha and some of the most important monks of Buddhism or they could also contain what? They could also contain belongings. They could also contain belongings of Buddha or belongings of other very very important monks of uh, Buddhism. Okay. And if you if we talk about the origin of stupas, if we talk about the origin of stupas, then uh, stupas are largely considered to be pre-Buddhist. What I mean by this, I mean by this, what do I mean by this? I mean that stupas were also present during the lifetime of Buddha. In fact, it is generally believed that Buddha himself desired, Buddha himself desired to be uh, in a way, he said that once you cremate me, please bury my ashes in a stupa. He himself wanted to be buried in a stupa. Okay, by buried I mean he wanted his ashes to be buried in a stupa. Okay, Buddha himself. And stupa architecture. Okay, stupa architecture. But, but although stupas are pre-Buddhist in origin, but stupa architecture became popular. Stupa architecture became popular only after the death of Buddha. Only when Buddha was, uh, only when Buddha's ashes were buried in a stupa, it led to a what? It led to a sudden rise in the in the growth of stupa architecture. I'll talk about that. Okay. See the earliest stupas, just like it happens with all kinds of religious structures. The earliest stupas are also simple structures, but with time they began to be heavily ornamented. In fact, the Ashokan, the Ashokan stupas were also very simple structures. The Ashokan stupas were also very simple structures. They did not even have Toranas. I'll talk about the salient features of the stupa architecture in a bit. Okay, Ashokan stupas were called Toranu Nasil. Torans were added. For example, Sanchi stupa was built by Ashok. Toran was not there initially. Toran was added to Sanchi Stupa by, by whom? By the son of Pushya Mitra Shung, whose name was Agni Mitra Shung. Okay? See, they began to be heavily ornamented with different relief and sculptural work associated with Buddhism. Now, let me just draw the Stupa for you. Okay, that will help you understand. Okay? See, Okay.
ओके दीज आर सम ऑफ द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट फीचर्स ऑफ अ स्तूपा ओके दीज आर सम ऑफ द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट फीचर्स ऑफ अ स्तूपा ओके दीज आर सम ऑफ द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट फीचर्स ऑफ अ स्तूपा कैन यू सी दिस पर्टिकुलर स्ट्रक्चर दिस स्ट्रक्चर ओके दिस स्ट्रक्चर एज यू कैन सी हियर ओके दिस स्ट्रक्चर एज यू कैन सी हियर इज नोन एज अंडा ए एन डी ए अंडा ओके this structure is known as anda this particular structure is known as anda okay i hope the image is visible this is known as anda okay what does anda represents anda okay this particular structure anda represents the cycle of life and death theek hai sir this particular structure anda the hemispherical shaped structure it represents the cycle of life and death as we all know buddhism also believes in the cycle of life and death okay which is known as samsara atak samsara kwa hai it's a it's a i mean the only way you can put an end to this cycle of life and death is by attaining is by attaining what nirvana is by attaining nirvana according to buddhism so anda represents the cycle of life and death okay then right above the anda okay can you see this particular structure this particular structure is known as harmika and this particular structure has been shaped like a what like a fire altar this particular structure has been shaped like a fire altar by havan kund How? why and why is harmika on top of anda why not somewhere else because it signifies or it tells okay it indirectly tells us that If we have to rise up the cycle of life and death, माने अमी जो भी अंदर ऊपर ले जाओ लगे। If we have to rise up the cycle of life and death, we need to burn. Okay, we need to burn certain certain vices. Like for example, we need to burn certain qualities like ego and anger. Only once you burn certain qualities like ego and anger, then you can rise up under. So swag. Harmika has also been shaped like a fire altar, because fire altar is a place where you burn things. ठीक है सर? And right, okay. This is Harmika, okay. This particular structure is Harmika. And right from the middle of Harmika, you will see a straight line, okay. I'm talking about this particular straight line. You will see a straight line. What is this particular straight line? This is known as Danda. okay this is known as danda or axis mundi okay what is the purpose of this axis mundi danda or axis mundi what is the purpose of this danda this danda in a way it connects it connects the world of living with the world of dead okay so i mean axis mundi the concept of axis mundi is also present in hinduism but now we are more focused on stupa so Just like in Hinduism, the concept of axis mundi is also there in Buddhism. So this is the axis mundi, danda. Okay, so it is believed that it is that particular line which connects the world of the living with the world of the dead, or let's say world of the living with the world of the gods. But then this world with the other world, it is something which connects this world with the other world. Okay, sir. Now. Okay, can you see this umbrella-like structures? Okay, you will see three structures. Okay, three structures which wrap themselves around. Okay, three structures wrapping themselves around the danda. These are known as chhatra. These are known as chhatra. What is the importance of chhatra, and why do we get to see only three chhatras? They indicate what? A three ta chhatra ki indicate kore. They indicate three ratna of Buddhism. They indicate what? Three ratna of Buddhism. They indicate three ratna of Buddhism. And what are the three ratna or three jewels of Buddhism? Dhamma, Sangha, and Buddha. Okay, Dhamma, Sangha, and Buddha. Okay, the three jewels of Buddhism. Okay, these three chhatras represent the. Three ratna of Buddhism: Dhammam Sharanam Gachami, Sangham Sharanam Gachami, and Buddham Sharanam Gachami. So the three jewels of Buddhism. Am I clear? Okay. And see, we also have something called Medhi. 
Okay, basically Medhi is what? Medhi is the platform on which under rest. Okay, Medhi is the platform on which under rest. And here I cannot draw one thing. There was also something known as Pradakshina Path. Okay, so Pradakshina Path. Pradakshina or Pradakshin Path. Pradakshin Path. Where you will find Pradakshin Path? Production path is found around the anda. Mane, what is the purpose of production path? Production path is that path, okay, or is that path which is used by devotees to, to revolve around, to revolve around the anda. Okay, it is considered a very pious act to revolve. It's a way of worshipping the stupa. Okay, so they revolve, they circumambulate. That's the right word. Okay. Circumambulate kora. Circumambulate. Thika se? Circumambulate. They circumambulate the anda. And that particular road is known as what? Production path. Apart from these structures, one of the most important structures present in a Buddhist stupa is Toran. What is basically, what is the meaning of Toran? These are the gateways. These are the gateways through which you can go to a stupa. Normally, there were how many Torans? Normally there were four Torans. And what do they represent? They represented or they represent four most important events that happened in the life of Buddha. His birth, okay, his birth when he attained enlightenment, his first sermon that is also known as Dhamma Chakra Pravartan and then his death, Mahapari Nibbana. So the so the four Torans in North, West, East and South, they represent the four most important events that happened in the life of Gautam Buddha. Four Torans. And these Torans were basically, uh, these Torans, by the way, are also important from the point of view of, from the point of view of aesthetics. Karan, Gutte Tumar due to sculptural art as by relief. Okay. They used to carve different paintings. They used to carve different images on the panels. They will have panels. They will have panels. Okay. They used to. Okay. They used to draw. They used to carve. They used to make a lot of beautiful sculptures. Okay. They used to make a lot of beautiful sculptures. Are they sculptures? Is sculptural works? Will have themes. Kya sila? The themes were obviously religious. Thikas hai. The the themes were obviously religious. The themes were. They also largely depicted the most important events in the life of Buddha. Apart from it, they also depicted Jataka tales. They also depicted events from the Jataka tales. What is the meaning of Jataka tales? Jataka tales are those stories which tell us about the previous births of Gautam Buddha. What was the purpose? Karanswa, Torans mila khodai bahirot thake. Okay, Torans mila bahirot thake. They are the gateways. So when a passerby will... When, when any person will walk past the Toran, he will get attracted by the sculptural work of the Toran. Okay, obviously that thing will catch his attention and notice. He will have this curiosity to know more about the religion. Okay, and that curiosity will take him towards the stupa. And who knows, once he visits the stupa, he might as well get converted to Buddhism. Okay, that was the idea, to attract people towards Buddhism. So these are some of the most essential features of Stupa architecture. Okay. Now in conclusion we can say that stupas are one of our richest tangible heritages. They are not only an excellent example of our polished architectural skills but also an indicator of the socio-religious beliefs of those times okay see the advent of buddhism led to a sudden rise of architectural activity in the indian subcontinent lucd now what is the introduction so what is the question buddhism there was a sudden rise in architectural activity we have to admit it because just before buddhism there was not much of a progress happening in that field so basically the question is asking you to establish the relation between Buddhism and the growth in architectural activities. I hope the question is clear. Now let's look at the answer. See, Buddhism was not just another Nastika school of thought. Be it Jainism, be it Buddhism, be it Ajivika, be it Charvika. 
Charvaka, all these are known as what? Nastika schools of thought because they did not believe in Mane, they did not follow the Vedas. They did not follow the Vedas, uh, you know, in letter and spirit. Okay? They might take inspiration from the Vedas. They, they might have taken some amount of inspiration from the Vedas. For example, any other uh, Hindu scriptures. Okay? For example, the Buddhist concept of Nirvana itself seems to be inspired from the Vedic concept or the Upanishadic. Okay? Or the Upanishadic concept of what? The Upanishadic concept of Moksha. Okay? Moksha and uh, basically they mean the same thing. Moksha and uh, Tumar uh, Nirvana. Okay? Or Nibbana. They mean the same thing. But Moksha came earlier than Nibbana because Moksha has been mentioned in Upanishads. So although they have been inspired, but they were largely against the Vedas. So we call them what? Nastika school of thought. The word Nastika doesn't mean they did not believe in God. The word Nastika means they did not believe in the authority of the Vedas. That's the meaning of Nastik. And the opposite to that is Astik. Okay? So basically as it had what deep consequences in the realm of Indian art and architecture, Buddhism. Let's see how. See. Buddha, while he was alive, while he was alive, he started a practice by the name of Vasavasa. Okay, what was the meaning of Vasavasa? To understand Vasavasa, we have to go a bit back in time. See, Buddha also started the concept of Sangha. Okay, just a short while ago, I told you Sangha is one of the three Ratnas of Buddhism. Okay, what is the meaning of Sangha? Buddhist monastery. Okay, Buddhist monastery. The concept of having a monastery is said to have been started by Buddha for the first time in uh, India, okay, having a monastery consisting of monks. So, once Buddha established this particular institution known as Sangha, so obviously he also laid down certain rules and regulations and one of the rules which was expected to be followed by the monks, okay, who were known as, who were known as, who were known as bhikshuks and bhikshunis, male monks and female monks. They were expected to propagate the ideas of Buddhism. Okay, they were expected to travel long distances. They were not allowed to rest. They were expected to keep on traveling throughout the year. They were expected to keep on traveling throughout the year, propagating the ideas of Gautam Buddha. But they were allowed to take rest only during one time in a year. Okay, during one time in a year, they were allowed to take rest. And when they were allowed to take rest? During the monsoons. That thing was known as what? Vasa Vasa. Okay, that thing was known as Vasa Vasa. The word Vasa Vasa comes from the word Vasa, which in Pali means rains. So, so, now, why is it important from the point of view of art and architecture? Now that he has allowed, now that Buddha has allowed the monks to stay and what did he say? He also said that I am allowing to, I mean, during the monsoons, I am, I am, I am, I am allowing you to stay. I am allowing you to stay in one place, but you have to stay outside the city limits. You have to stay outside the city limits. That led to the development of Buddhist. Okay, that led to the development of a certain kind of Buddhist architecture known as Chaityas and Viharas. Okay, Chaityas. What were Chaityas? Chaityas were places of worship and Viharas were places of residence for the monks. So once they started living outside the city limits, they must have felt the need. They must have felt the need to what? They must have felt the need of uh, living somewhere. They must have felt the need of living somewhere. And that is how, that is how according to a certain set of scholars, rock cut architecture developed in India. Pahar Katikati, Bonua architecture. So this is very, very important. Chaityas and Viharas. That is how the Buddhist Chaityas and Viharas came into existence. See, it is also said that Buddha desired his ashes to be buried, okay, uh, in a stupa after his death. Like I said, while talking about the stupa architecture, Buddha, while he was alive, he desired to be, he, he said that he desired his ashes to be buried in a stupa after his death. So, Ajat Shatru, okay, Ajat Shatru, it is said that who is Ajat Shatru? Ajat Shatru was the son of Bimbisara, okay. Haryanka dynasty. I am talking about Magad. They were rulers of Magad. Because they were rulers of Magad. So Ajat Shatru and Ajat Shatru was a contemporary of Gautam Buddha. 
Okay, Ajahn Shatru was the same person who convened the first Buddhist council right after the death of Gautam Buddha. And he became a follower of Gautam Buddha, he became a Buddhist. And after his death, he said to have built eight stupas. Okay, he said to have built eight stupas at different places, like for example, Raja Griha, this was the first capital of Magad. Then Veshali, the center of Lichavis, Kushinagar, okay, and distributed Buddha's relics. Ashoka, when Ashoka came to power and he became a Buddhist, it is said that it is said that although although it seems although it seems improbable, highly improbable, it, it is said that he built 84,000 stupas all over the country to spread the influence of Buddhism. Okay, and some of the examples of the stupas which were built by Ashoka were the Maha Stupa or the Grand Stupa, which today you will get to see in Sachi. Okay, you will get to see three stupas, but out of which only one stupa, that is the Great Stupa or the Maha Stupa was built by Ashoka. The other two stupas were built by Agnimitra Shung. Now, and another very important stupa was Tumar, built by Ashoka was Amravati Stupa and then Bharut Stupa. Where is Amravati Stupa present? Amravati Stupa is in Andhra Pradesh. Bharut Stupa is in Madhya Pradesh. And Sachi Stupa is also present in the Raisen district of Madhya Pradesh. Very, very important. Okay, Kanishka, we all know he later embraced Mahayana Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism allowed human representation of Buddha. And once human representation of Buddha was allowed, Buddha began to be represented in the form of key humans. So automatically, so Kanishka became a follower of Mahayana form of Buddhism and he patronized what? Two very important schools of art, Gandhar and Mathura schools of art. Okay, Gandhar and Mathura schools of art, they mainly focused on what? Representation of Gautam Buddha. How to represent Gautam Buddha in two different uh, forms. So, Gandhar and Mathura school of arts. Very, very, uh, very, very important. Okay, mainly now we are talking about a phase where Gautam Buddha began to be represented in the form of statues. Where you will get to see statues are being made of Gautam Buddha. Okay, statues. And believe it or not, according to historians, According to historians, Gautam Buddha was the first god to be worshipped in the form of a statue in India. Okay, Gautam Buddha, under the patronage of Mahayana form of Buddhism, under the patronage of rulers like Kanishka, he became the first god to be worshipped in the form of in the form of uh, in the form of a statue. According to many scholars. Okay. Now, so, yeah, so uh, I mean, if we have to give an example of uh, if we have to give an example of one statue of Buddha. Then, seated Buddha from Gandhar is a very famous example from the Kushan period. You can actually check out the image of seated Buddha from Gandhar. It belongs from the Kushan period. And there were many differences between Gandhar school of art and Mathura schools of art also. By the way, Gandhar school of art. Why Gandhar and why Mathura? Because uh, Kanishka came up with the idea of having two capitals. Okay, One capital was located at Mathura and the other capital was located at Peshawar. Okay, of Purushapura. At that time it was known as Purushapura. Now it is known as Peshawar. It's in Pakistan as we all know. And Purushapura used to be a city of Gandhar. So the, you know, the style, okay, the art or the school of art that emerged out of Purushapura came to be known as Gandhar school of art because Purushapura was a part of Gandhar and the other school came to be known as Mathura school of art. These had many differences also. But the similarity was what? Similarity was both of them represented Gautam Buddha. Okay? Represented Gautam Buddha. For example, Gandhar school of art, the material which was used was grey schist. Okay, schist is a, uh, you know, it's a kind of rock. It's a kind of rock. But the principal building material used in Mathura school of art was what? Dotted red sandstone. Then again, Mathura school of art did not have any foreign influence. But if you look at the location of Gandhar, it is very close to, uh, it is, it was, it was located, Gandhar was located at a region which was inhabited by Greeks. So obviously it came under the influence of Greeks. So you will see a lot of Greek influence, for example, the use of Greek motifs like rosette and palmet. Okay, for example, the Mathura Buddha, he does not wear a woolen clothes. He wears a transparent cloth. Okay, he wears a transparent piece of cloth. But the Gandhar Buddha wears something called Roman Todaga. Okay, Roman Todaga. It's a, in simple words, it's a, it's a woolen cloth. Why? Because Gandhar is colder than Mathura. Okay, sir. So these were some of the differences. Okay, these were some of the differences. 
Now, then later, obviously, we had Ajanta caves. Okay, later Ajanta caves were constructed under the Sadvahanas and the Vakatakas. Why I am talking about Ajanta caves? Because Ajanta caves, unlike the Elora caves, they are they are only Buddhist caves. You will find a total number of thirty caves in Ajanta. Among these 30 caves, 29 are in a completed form. One is an incomplete, but all the caves have been dedicated to Buddhism. And I mean, Ajanta caves, the construction of these caves can be divided into two phases. Because uh, one phase, I mean, one phase is known as the Sadvahana phase, the other phase is known as the Vakataka phase. So, what I'm trying to say is some of the caves of Ajanta or some of the caves in Ajanta were built under the patronage of the Sadvahanas. And some of the other caves, okay, at Ajanta were built under the patronage of Vakatakas. Who were Vakatakas? With time, Sadvahanas. Sadvahanas, Kini, with time, they got split into two groups, Vakatakas of Maharashtra and Kadambas of Karnataka. Because I am talking about dead Vakatakas. So, Vakatakas came after Sadvahanas. And by the way, Vakatakas also came under the influence of Guptas. Okay, after Chandragu Vikram Aditya, okay, after Chandragu Vikram Aditya gave his daughter in marriage to a Pakataka king. And in Ajanta caves, we get to see five Chaityas and 25 Viharas. Then, I mean, obviously, Ajanta caves, and another very interesting fact about Ajanta caves is the Caves which were developed under the Sadvahana phase were largely an iconic phase. What is the meaning of an iconic? Buddha was not represented in the form of he was not represented in the form of uh, in the in the in the form of uh, Manadra. He was not represented in a human form. Okay, he was only shown in the form of symbols. An iconic means he was represented in the form of icons. Because and in Elora also see. In Elora also you will find Buddhist caves, but only 12 Buddhist caves. Out of a total number of 34 caves, only 12 caves have been dedicated to uh, Buddhism. Because in Elora you will also find Hindu caves and Jain caves. In fact, the Kailashna temple at Elora, built by a Rashtrakuta king by the name of Krishna, is considered to be the pinnacle of rock cut architecture in India. You can say? See, now, in conclusion, Buddhism not only revolutionized the society with its beliefs and tenets, but it also gave a new lease of life to architectural activity in India. But it also gave a new lease of life to architectural activity in India. Okay. See, Mauryan art is an example of alien grafting, a critically evaluate. Basically, it's an evaluation. Okay. Basically, uh, it's a it's a it's an acquisition it's an allegation which has been made against the Mauryan art and critically evaluate means what you have to uh, you have to give arguments in favor and then you have to give arguments against the statement because that's what and who made these allegations all these allegations are normally made by colonial historians because what is their objective and this allegation was made by colonial historians like Mortimer Wheeler what was the objective of uh, Mortimer Wheeler, he wanted to hit the confidence of the masses because what? Britain was practicing colonialism, India was a colony. So they will be able to sustain colonialism, the United Kingdom will be able to sustain colonialism only as long as the masses lack in confidence. So it was very important for the sustenance of colonialism that the masses do not gather enough confidence. So such things were said to make sure, to ensure that the masses do not end up having enough confidence. So, it was basically key koi sila, je, I mean the, 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 the Mauryan art, it was a copycat, okay, it was a direct copy of the Persian art. So, you Indians are good for nothing. That was what, okay, that was the idea, okay, that was what being said by most of the colonial historians like Mortimer Wheeler. So, this is just another example of that particular mentality. See, this acquisition was being a copy by, by colonial historians. I said it already. Now, arguments in favor. Why did they make? Now, when, when they made all these acquisitions, when they made all these acquisitions, they always provided a basis. They always provided a basis. Now, see, arguments in favor. Mauryan art undoubtedly was influenced by Persian art. 
ठीक है सर आर्ग्यूमेंट इन फेवर ठीक है सर मॉडियन आर्ट इट वॉज अनडाउटेडली इन्फ्लुएंस बाय पर्जियन आर्ट वी हैव टू अग्री ओके वी हैव टू अग्री टू इट द ग्लॉसी पॉलिश इन ऑल फॉर्म्स इन ऑल मॉडियन आर्ट ठीक है सर इन ऑल मॉडियन आर्ट यू विल फाइन द यूसेज ऑफ ग्लॉसी पॉलिश एंड ग्लॉसी मैंने की शाइनी ओके क्या बात है शाइन हुए थे आरु दैट ग्लॉसी पॉलिश इज समथिंग व्हिच इज सेड टू बी अ कैरेक्टरिस्टिक ऑफ द पर्शियन आर्ट ठीक है सर ग्लॉसी ग्लॉसी पॉलिश एंड द पर्शियन पिलर्स आल्सो हैड कैपिटल्स ठीक है सर द पर्शियन पिलर्स आल्सो हैड कैपिटल्स सो वी विल टॉक अबाउट सो अमंग ऑल द पर्शियन आर्ट फॉर्म्स वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इंपोर्टेंट आर्ट फॉर्म्स इज व्हाट मॉडियन अशोक एंड पिलर्स अशोक इज उन बिलक पिलर एडिक्स बनाई सिले to propagate the ideas of buddhism the other day i was talking about ashok and pillar edicts so those pillar edicts mainly this acquisition this acquisition concerns okay that particular kind of mauryan architecture ashok and pillars generally mortimer villar ki koisile that ashok and pillars are a direct copy of persian art or let's say they are a direct copy of persian pillars which we have to why which we have to oppose which we have to oppose so persian pillars also had capitals okay and ashokan pillars also had capitals theek hai sir we are now giving arguments in favor and obviously persian pillars also had the bell shaped part so if you look at the ashokan pillars there is a part which is known as inverted lotus okay i'll 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 show you a picture theek hai sir inverted lotus theek hai sir inverted lotus wait i'll show you a picture See, okay. As you can see, this is the part I I am talking about. Okay, this is the part I am talking about. Below this part, it looks like an inverted lotus. So I am talking about this. Something like this was also present in the Persian pillar, and this is also present in the Ashokan pillar. ठीक है This structure is known as abacus. This particular structure is known as abacus. So above the inverted lotus, there was abacus, and above the abacus, there was capital. And this is the lion capital. I'll come to capital. ठीक है सर? So ठीक है सर? Now let's deal with arguments against the statement. Now swa. The first statement, the chef of Ashoka Pillar. Okay, let me draw it for you very quickly. See, uh, see, Ashokan pillar. Was something like this. Okay, this was the chef, my main part. Our A is it? Tomorrow, tapering. My tapering. My key. Swap. upar swa okay d d d the upper part of this particular structure is getting thinner and thinner okay as and when it is going above it is getting thinner the uppermost part a design to ki koy tapering design boli koy tapering theek hai a design to koy tapering this structure is known as shaft theek hai this particular structure is known as shaft theek hai etia what was the argument against जे शेफ तो की होय अशोकन पिलर और टेपरिंग होय लाइक आई शोड यू इट इज टेपरिंग अपवर्ड्स बट बट द पर्शियन पिलर्स डू नॉट हैव दिस पर्टिकुलर स्टाइल दे डू नॉट टेपर दे डू नॉट बिकम थिनर एज दे मूव अपवर्ड्स दे डू नॉट बिकम थिनर ओके दे डू नॉट बिकम थिनर बेसिकली वी आर नाउ फाइंडिंग आउट द डिफरेंसेस एंड लकीली डिफरेंसेस आउटवे The number of similarities by far, बहुत बेसी differences है. Similarities बहुत कम है, differences बहुत बेसी है. And this is difference number one. ठीक है सर. आरु जे इस एक बार tapering zone तो बस तो a tapering is a part of what is a part of an indigenously developed style of architecture. 
it is a part of an indigenously developed indian style of architecture by the name of graviated style okay which is also which is known as what graviated style is something which is an indigenous which 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 doesn't have any foreign influence which has developed in india itself theek hai sir that is what swa ashokan chef ek jo number mark chef ko dekha lo the main structure it is monolithic built out of a single rock ओके अनलाइक पर्शियन पिलर्स पर्शियन पिलर्स बिना की होय पर्शियन पिलर्स बिना कोर जो शेफ थके द शेफ इज बिल्ड और द शेफ वाज बिल्ड बाय जॉइनिंग सेवरल स्टोन्स बाय जॉइनिंग सेवरल स्टोन्स अनलाइक अशोकन पिलर्स व्हिच वर बिल्ड आउट ऑफ अ सिंगल लार्ज स्टोन और अ रॉक ठीक है सर ओके पर्शियन पिलर्स हैव टू बेल शेप्ड पोर्शंस है द मोस्ट ऑफ इनवर्टेड लोटस टू देखा लो दिस बेल शेप पोर्शन इट मींस दैट so persian pillars bilak or tenek what they used to have two bell shaped portions but the ashokan pillars have only one bell shaped portion or one inverted lotus that is another difference no inscription is persian pillars see i told you okay ashoka came up with the idea of pillars mainly to propagate okay mainly to propagate dhamma mainly to propagate dhamma theek hai sir so he had he had uh, you know his pillars carried inscription each and every pillar carried inscription Each and every Ashokan pillar had something written on it. Why not? Had something written on it, but Persian pillars did not carry any inscription. So uh, even even in the uh, capital, meaning that just like I showed you that particular lion. So capitals can be human capitals also, lion capitals also. The topmost part of a pillar of an Ashokan pillar is known as capital. Capital can be of animals also. Capitals can be of humans also. Persian pillars, villa courts, and villa capital are still there. they used to have what human capitals kintu ashokan pillars have animal capitals aru moreover ashoka very smartly uses those animals okay he uses horses he uses lions he uses bulls he uses those animals in his capital which have socio cultural or let's say socio religious significance in india which have a socio religious significance in india we all know the importance of these animals in the indian context they have they all have a socio religious significance so he is using all these animals he is using all these animals some of the animals also have a relation with gautam buddha so how can we say that it's a direct copy of persian art theek hai sir and and on top of it if we talk about the glossy polish okay glossy polish which is present in mauryan art in ashokan pillars as well as in persian pillars that glossy polish now as per the latest researches okay many researches have been done and it has been found that this polish is the same which has been used in northern and bpw that is what northern black polished ware that is the kind of pottery which became very popular during the age of mahajana padars remember northern black polished ware so northern black polished ware or jute to polish or use hoy sile ashoka according to the latest researches was using the same pillar which means that it was an indigenously it was an indigenously made pillar in fact the recipe to make this pillar it has also been found that the recipe to make this pillar has been mentioned in apastamba stupa uh, sutra Okay, the recipe to make this pillar has been mentioned in Apastamba Sutra. Okay, very very interesting. So Mauryan art has no doubt. Okay, it has no doubt been influenced by Persian art, which is a consequence of the Persian invasion. However, influence can never be called an act of alien grafting. Okay, alien grafting means that copy. Okay, foreign or para, kiba copy kora alien grafting. ठीक है सर इट कैन नेवर बी कॉल ठीक है सर इन्फ्लुएंस हुआ तो मैं कॉपी करने के को बा यस ऑफ कोर्स मॉरियन आर्ट हैज बीन इन्फ्लुएंस्ड बाय पर्शियन आर्ट बट बेस्ड ऑन दैट जस्ट बेस्ड ऑन दैट वी कैन नॉट से मॉरियन आर्ट इज अ डायरेक्ट कॉपी ऑफ पर्शियन आर्ट वी कैन नेवर से दैट ओके द डिफरेंस बिटवीन द अशोका एंड पर्शियन पिलर्स फार आउट नंबर द सिमिलरिटीज ओके डिस्क्राइब द एन आइकॉनिक फेज ऑफ बुद्धिज्म Describe the an iconic phase of Buddhism and the various creative expressions associated with it. Okay, like I said a short while ago, an iconic phase of Buddhism refers to that phase when Buddha was represented in the form of symbols, not icons. And an iconic phase is related with what? With 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 the first or with the original form of 
Buddhism, which later came to be known as what? Hinayan school of Buddhism. Okay, that was the Buddhism which was originally taught by Gautam Buddha as per the scholars. Okay, because Gautam Buddha himself never considered him, uh, never, never, never considered himself to be a god. So the Hinayan form of Buddhism also doesn't elevate Gautam Buddha to the status of a god. And because it does not elevate Gautam Buddha to the status of a god, it it prohibits human representation of Gautam Buddha because it fears that if if it allows human representation of Gautam Buddha, it might lead to idol worship. So it puts a restriction on human representation of Gautam Buddha. Yeah, now that it has put a restriction on human representation of Gautam Buddha, the people have to do something. The people have to represent Gautam Buddha in some manner after his death. So they came up with the idea of representing Gautam Buddha or showing Gautam Buddha in the form of key symbols. So basically this question is asking you about those symbols, about those motives. Okay. Because eh? So Hinayan form of Buddhism, it did so as it did not consider Buddha to be a divine being. I say this already. See, Buddha came to be represented in the form of symbols. These symbols could be seen in Buddhist architecture everywhere. The most famous symbols were, okay, the most famous symbols were Bodhi tree. Now, you will also have to explain the significance of these symbols. So, Bodhi tree, what is the significance? What is the relation between Bodhi tree and Gautam Buddha? Mane, Bosudu Buzipwa. In place of Gautam Buddha, they are using symbols. Because they cannot pay, they cannot make, uh, they cannot make a sculpture. They cannot show Gautam Buddha in person. Because that is prohibited. So, they are using symbols. So, Jetia, the moment people saw these symbols, they could now make out that these symbols represent Gautam Buddha. Because Bodhi tree, because it is said that Gautam Buddha, he sat under this tree. It was under this tree. It was under this tree that Gautam Buddha is said to have attained enlightenment at Bodh Gaya. So, he attained enlightenment at Bodh Gaya. So, Bodhi tree is talking about the enlightenment. Okay, that particular event of Gautam Buddha. Let's say lotus. Lotus is something which is always associated with purity. So lotus was also used to represent Gautam Buddha. Horse. Horse is something which is associated with the event of Mahabhinishkraman which happened in the life of Gautam Buddha when Gautam Buddha, he left all the worldly pleasures. He was also a prince. He left his one fine night. He decided to leave his palace in search of the ultimate truth. And he left his palace by by, by, by riding his horse named Kanthak. So this horse represents what? The Mahabhinishkraman, which is also known as the Great Departure, which happened in the life of Gautam Buddha. Okay, empty throne. Empty throne again represents the enlightenment part of Gautam Buddha. Because, and generally this empty throne is always placed under the Bodhi tree. So you will see that on top there is the Bodhi tree and under the Bodhi tree an empty throne has been placed. Okay, why empty? Because they cannot show Gautam Buddha. So it is understood that Gautam Buddha is sitting on the throne. Because then white elephant. White elephant is something which is associated with the birth of Gautam Buddha. Because once it so happened that before the birth of Gautam Buddha, Gautam Buddha's mother, Mahamaya, she once saw a dream. And in that particular dream, she saw that a white elephant is entering her womb. And the very next day when she consulted with the experts, okay, with the religious experts, they told her, they told her that this indicates that the baby you are going to give birth, the baby who is who is going to come to this world, he will he will either be a great king or a great uh, teacher. He will either be a great ruler or a great teacher. And later, as we saw, Gautam Buddha became a great teacher. Okay. So white elephant is something which is associated with the birth of Gautam Buddha and stupa. Stupa itself, stupa we saw. Okay, we saw the meaning of stupa. Stupa itself means what? Stupa itself is associated with the uh, Mahaparinibbana. Okay, stupa itself is associated with the Mahaparinibbana of Gautam Buddha or death of Gautam Buddha. So stupa in itself represented the Mahaparinibbana of Gautam Buddha. And these were some of the ways how Buddha was represented in the form of symbols. So the, so the aniconic phase of Buddhism, although did not represent Buddha in human form, contributed handsomely to the development of sculptural activity. 
Okay. Say comment on the company school of painting with special reference to Raja Ravi Verma. What is the meaning of company school? To simply put, company school of painting is that school of painting which was introduced by the Britishers in India. Okay, which was introduced by the Britishers in India. It so happened, so a company school of painting, that is the Britishers bila ke, uh, especially after Warren Hastings, after the reforms of Warren Hastings, when Warren Hastings abolished, I'm talking about, let's say, 1780s. Okay, after Warren Hastings came to India, he abolished the dual system which was introduced by Robert Clive. And after abolishing the dual system, after the dual, uh, after the system of dual government was abolished, then the British officials started collecting revenue themselves. Okay, before that they were just giving orders. Okay, revenue collection department. Okay, they were they had the power to collect revenue, but they themselves were least bothered to uh, collect revenue. They always delegated the authority. But now. Once the system of dual government has been abolished, see the system of dual government means what? Because absolute power and zero responsibility. Now, with the abolishment or with the eradication of this system, in certain degrees, okay, in some, you know, in some way, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in a certain way, the Britishers now also have to shoulder some amount of responsibility. And one of those responsibilities was to collect revenue from far-flung areas that means what now the british officials were deployed in far-flung areas they got a chance to travel the length and breadth of india and when they traveled the length and breadth of india they came across all the beautiful things of india they came across the indian temples they came across the indian festivals they came across what they came across the flora and fauna of india and the landscape of india and they were mesmerized upon seeing all these things they were so mesmerized that they wanted to that they wanted to paint all these things with this intention with this intention they established three schools of painting one in madras one in calcutta one in bombay these three schools of painting were known as company schools of paintings and they started training the indians in this particular western style of painting now if we talk about the uniqueness of this western style or company school of painting normally what way what did they how was it different so first and foremost they introduced they introduced what they introduced the technique of or the or the or the art of using watercolor they introduced the art of using watercolor apart from it they also introduced the concept of 3d okay they also introduced the concept of 3d in the area of indian paintings so these were i mean apart from it they also they also introduce a concept which is known as line of sight all these three things are important contributions of this company school of painting and company school of painting in these ways it was different from the traditional school of indian painting and all other schools of indian painting even the mughal school of indian painting even the rajputana school of indian painting they, and these painters, all these Indian painters, all these Indian painters who were trained in the Western style of painting were known as what? Company artists or company kalams. And the greatest of these, the greatest of these Indian artists who were trained in Western style of painting was Raja Ravi Verma. He was from Travancore. He was from Travancore. Now let's learn about Raja Ravi Verma. See, uh, once they established the company schools of paintings in three places, they also invited European experts. They also invited European experts to come to India and train the Indians. Because now Raja Ravi Verma, see Raja Ravi Verma, like I said, he he uh, mostly focused. Okay, he mostly focused. What were the themes? Okay, what were the themes of Raja Ravi Verma? What did he focus on? What did he paint? He picked up themes from Indian mythology. Okay, that is one thing. He picked up themes from Indian mythology, especially he became famous for the depiction of female uh, characters. He became famous for the depiction of female characters from Indian mythology. Like for example, Hamsa Damyanti. Okay, like for example, Shakuntala. Like for example, Draupadi. And Raja Ravi Verma, he used what? He used... First and foremost, he was not a Raja. Okay, Raja was a title which was given to him. And he became very wealthy. Okay, because he became very, very popular. <laughs> because of his uh, paintings. Now, so he used both oil and water painting. 
ठीक है सर ही यूज बोथ ऑयल एंड वाटर पेंटिंग सम ऑफ हिज फेमस वर्क्स लाइक आई से द्रौपदी शकुंतला हंस दमयंती एंड जटायु वध आर सम ऑफ हिज मोस्ट फेमस वर्क्स फेमस वर्क्स अपार्ट फ्रॉम इट ही आल्सो बिकेम द फर्स्ट इंडियन आर्टिस्ट टू ड्रॉ टू पेंट टू पेंट और to paint national heroes like shivaji and adi shankaracharya okay the person who gave the concept of advait okay adi shankaracharya so in fact most of the current day pictures that we get to see in our homes most of the current day pictures of lord vishnu and lord shiva were initially painted they were painted by raja ravi varma but the greatest contribution of raja ravi varma is yet to come he became very very wealthy He became very, very popular, very, very wealthy. But how did he use his wealth is of immense importance. He did not use his wealth for personal gains, but he used his wealth to buy a very expensive. He imported a very expensive printing machine, and with the help of that printing machine, he established a, a printing press. Okay, he established a printing press in Bombay, and he started. He started printing copies. He started printing. copies of his works and he started selling them and he started selling those copies of his works at a very cheap price at a throw away price at just one anna one anna what did this do what did it lead to it made his work available to the masses it made his work available to the masses and slowly and steadily it also took the form of calendar art i mean रेक्टर बिकॉज he played a very important role in national integration also how do you integrate people one way to integrate people is to integrate them in the name of religion now that raja ravi varma let's say like i said he started painting images of lord shiva and lord vishnu and now after buying that particular machine now that he has started selling them at just one anna when more and more people are buying it and all the people okay all the people following the hindu religion in india are using the same kind of image of lord shiva and lord vishnu so obviously it will lead to national unification obviously obviously it will play a very decisive role in national integration that is that is the greatest contribution of raja ravi varma that is the greatest contribution of raja ravi varma okay in conclusion we can say that the company school okay the company school of painting introduced many new features in the realm of indian paintings although it also attracted opposition from the likes of bengal school of painting so bengal school of paintings i'm talking about painters like abhinendra nath tagore they were opposed to the company school of painting due to various reasons theek hai sir but okay despite their opposition the company school of painting it managed to survive but the greatest outcome the greatest outcome of this company school of painting or the british school of painting in india's context or in india's perspective obviously was raja ravi varma the reasons have been shared with you already okay so thank you so much for this session i'll come uh, i'll come in another session based on indian society very soon okay thank you so much theek hai sir keep following csap